At this time, I will call the meeting of the Marshall City Council to order with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to welcome everyone here this evening. We have an agenda before us. Are there any changes to that agenda? Not will operate under that agenda, and we'll move uh, to agenda item number two, which would be to consider the approval of the minutes of the work session as well as the minutes of the regular meeting. Both were held on March 12, 2019. The council does have the minutes of both of those meetings. Are there any uh, corrections to note? Move to accept. Second. Motion by Steve, seconded by Jim to accept the minutes as they have been proposed. We'll move to a vote. Mayor, I was put on the wrong agenda here. Here we go. I'm in. So we'll move to a vote. Close the voting. And the motion does pass. So we'll move to agenda item number three. This is the, the first of a number of public hearings that we're going to have this evening. The, uh, so just the comments on the, the procedure for the public hearings at the public hearings. And the first one is a continuation. So we've actually had this explanation uh, when it uh, was first convened. But this will also be for the other public hearings that we'll have this evening. Um, when we uh, go to the public hearings, we'll have a brief presentation by staff. And then following that, we'll open up for comments from any interested member of the audience. If uh, members of the audience wish to speak, we do ask you to come up and use the podium because this is a broadcast also on cable access television. So you need to use the microphone at the podium. And then for the clerk, identify your yourself as well as the, your property address. And then we'll also open it up for input that the council may have and then once all the input is there, and the purpose is to get all the input because it is a public hearing, once all the input is given, then we'll close the public hearing. So with that, I would uh, uh, call to order the uh, public hearing on the Michigan Road, Superior Road Reconstruction Project. This is a continuation of a public hearing on the assessment. So I'll call on Director of Public Works, City Engineer Glenn Olson um, to conduct this public hearing. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, just a little bit of background for the people watching at home. Uh, this project is the reconstruction project of, of Superior Road and Michigan Road in the Industrial Park. Uh, a map is showing on the screen of what, what the project area was for, for this, uh, this assessment hearing. The information was, um, or the uh, assessment hearing was postponed a significant length of time. Back in October, it was postponed and specifically the reason for it was to review the assessment policy that we had in place. And that wasn't a simple procedure. It took a lot of time. It took a lot of um, input from both our, our committees and from other communities to help define a revision to the assessment process. And that, uh, that process came up with a three-prong recommendation. One, um, a, an assessment according to the original, the original method, which is by the front foot, total project cost. The second one was a, was a uh, method of associating residential assessments the $5,700 maximum, and converting that to an equivalent, um, uh, converting the equivalent industrial uh, frontage in this case uh, to to associate with that $5,700 maximum, uh, and it also took into account the street width compared to residential and the street strength compared to residential. The third one was a calculation by square footage uh, compared to the square footage of average residential properties 
and associating with the same type of, uh, of $5,700 maximum. We compared those three and recommend the lowest amount of those three with the uh, city ad valorem cost picking up any difference in what that would be. So that's what uh, this hearing is about. The uh, revised assessments were sent out to all the property owners so they could compare them against what they had before and then uh, the, the revised amount. So that's what we have in front of you tonight is the revised assessments based upon the three uh, scenarios that came forward from Ways and Means and was ultimately recommended for approval by council. That's all I have. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Glenn. We'll open up for input as part of the public hearing. My name is Lynn Cheddar. I'm representing Mustang Truck and Trailer. My son-in-law, Pete LLC, owns the building. He couldn't be here, so you received his letter. You all got to read it and whatnot. Uh, I guess if I can add anything, <coughs> the uh, you have a calculation. We've come to to an amount uh, as it relates to any, uh, what do you want to call it? Uh, not assessment, but uh, uh, appraisal. As it goes, I guess I don't see in the mathematics or as a justification what an appraisal amounts to. I haven't seen an amount for an appraisal on uh, our property in particular. Uh, I think I've heard the word project appraisal, but I guess I'd like to have an explanation and see what the project appraisal says in the supporting documents, because that is a factor that is on the table as part of the process to come up with the amount of an assessment and so the calculation is of interest how it commingles with you know an appraisal are really what we're interested in and uh, <laughs> out of that comes a number you know so uh, right now we don't feel the number is justified but I haven't seen all the information uh, that I'd like to see, I'd like to see the appraisal and how that what well, compares to or how that adds to the whole situation and a decision. So, uh, thank you, Lynn. The, um, there's Sharon, you may want to comment on that, but there's not an individual appraisal that has been conducted. Uh, we did a project appraisal, not a complete appraisal. Um, we have gotten data back from that project appraisal but due to potential pending litigation we've kept that data private uh, until we know that the pending litigation would go away and I don't know if we would review that status again to see if it would change but at this time I think that we've kept it private I can say that the the methods of comparisons to residential, lot front footage, um, average lot size were methods used by the project appraisal, appraiser rather. Uh, could I, could I, um, I did talk to an appraisal company up in the Twin Cities that does a number of appraisals throughout the state of Minnesota, mostly in the metropolitan area. And I, I asked him how they did their appraisals and he said they do a project appraisal and then they give the numbers to the city to allocate it to the mm -hmm. different parcels. And usually I think the city's then allocated on a, pair, a frontage foot basis. <clears throat> and so I, I think that 
I don't think that they go out there and appraise every single property individually. Mm -hmm. they, they look at the project as a whole, and then I think it's my understanding they rely on the city to come up with a way of allocating mm -hmm. those costs to the different properties. And I keep referring to it. It was not a formal appraisal. An appraiser gave us a project analysis of the front footage costs. Initially, our costs of construction were $166 per front foot. And her analysis said that this improvement would not support that $166 mm -hmm. per foot industrial cost. So that analysis gave us verification that that initial number was too high. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what the analysis accomplished. It, it verified mm -hmm. our, our initial numbers were too high, which has brought us back to the table to these current numbers here. Okay. Okay. And I guess part of, you know, part of the question we have is, you know, your letter to the council said that, you know, it does need to, uh, well, the benefit has to exceed the cost. That's, yeah. I mean, that's the primary consideration. That's, that's the primary yeah. consideration. Correct. And how we understand that is someone has to do an appraisal. Appraisals and are not required. Is, you do not see the word appraisal anywhere in the statute. Mm -hmm. An appraisal, a prior, before and after is not required prior to the establishment of these numbers. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I just look at this and we need to determine if any of us have a, an increase of any kind in the value of, I don't know if you say that's that linear foot or whatever. So somehow that needs to be incorporated into a mathematical, you know, calculation and how in the world do we judge whether we feel, you know, the number that's been given us is correct if I don't see some of that documentation to help justify or help me make my decision. And so consequently, not sharing it with us doesn't <coughs> seem to be, you know, plausible to me because it's part of the decision I have no desire to do any litigation, you know. I, we're all gentlemen here, and we can come to some, you know, decision, but without seeing uh, part of the information, uh, how do I make a value judgment? And I, I would think that would go for any of the land, you know, the property owners, as well as going forward for you guys you know, in the years ahead as this happens, how many times a year? But that would be our position. Thank you, Lynn. <clears throat> right? Good afternoon. Um, Brian Stuckey with BH Electronics. Uh, we're at 604 Michigan Road. Um, appreciate the work that the Ways and Means Committee may, did to try to review policy procedure. I know the uh, updates certainly had an impact on some of the property owners. Um, I just wanted to comment on a couple items. Uh, back in October when we uh, had the last uh, public hearing on the subject, um, several people on the council expressed the desire to have uh, the appraisal done for this particular project. Um, and the intent and in the discussion at that time was to determine the specific benefit to the property owners as it related to um, an increase in property value. And so a bit disappointed that that did not occur. Um, I know, Craig, you requested that. I think Jim as well. And, other, and then it was voted upon to move forward with that. But what we got instead was a project review and not an actual appraisal and any judgment on impact to the specific benefit for any of the property owners. And then the information that was gathered hasn't been shared with any of the people that have participated in that process. And so um, 
it's just a, no comment needed. I just wanted to share that and express that's the disappointment that we've got to this point where I know it's a long process six months later and we have still haven't got what we were looking for um, and requested by several of the council members back um, in October of last year. So I don't feel like we've necessarily moved too far forward with the policy. I know we've made changes, um, but we still didn't review any specific benefit received to any of the property owners as a result of that. So that's a concern that I have with the new amounts. Um, it still didn't make any consideration for that. Um, it didn't use that in any calculations. None of the new calculations include that. Um, I, 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 as I mentioned before, I did contact an appraisal company in the Twin Cities that does appraisals for a number of different cities, and uh, um, I was told by them that they really weren't interested in coming to Marshall, Minnesota. Uh, it was too far a distance for them to come, and they suggested an appraiser, and it happened to be the same appraiser that the city administrator had contacted and had met with us already. So. Uh, I, I did reach out to see if somebody was interested in coming out here and doing an appraisal to find out how much it would cost the city. Yeah. And the response from that person was that they really weren't interested in coming here. Okay. So as a part of the process and our due diligence, obviously we know that that's one way to determine the specific benefit to us as a business. business. And so there is appraisers. And like you said, you'd have to maybe go outside the city of Marshall to, to do that. Um, and we've got estimates um, from several companies that would be willing to do that. Of course, the cost is to the property owner, or if city was doing that, it would be the cost to the city, and that would be significant, somewhere between $7,500 or $10,000 could be the cost. And so I'm not sure how that compares to the project appraisal, but if we would have done that as a part of that, perhaps we could have um, seen what the benefit to the property owners was. Um, so I'm not sure um, what the other council members think if it satisfies their, I wasn't here a couple weeks ago when the policy was discussed, but it doesn't appear that it satisfies the request of some of the other council members. And so that's the disappointment that I have. Um, and I'm also concerned that I'm not willing to share, why wouldn't we wanna avoid litigation, um, share the information um, come up with something, a solution that works for everybody rather than uh, concealing it, keeping it private, not sharing it with uh, the businesses that are affected. Um, the other concern I had was um, when the April of last year, when the first public hearing was to talk about the project, um, there was concerns at that time by several of the council members about the assessment policy. And so the vote at that time, and I think Pete shared this in a letter that he uh, sent in from Pete LLC. Um, the vote at that time was a five to two vote and the law in Minnesota requires a four fifths majority to be able to move forward with any special assessment project unless you go to a, pu and then it, you'd have to go to a public vote. And so we didn't have that. The project moved forward um, with a 5-2 vote a couple times. Uh, the bonding was approved. But then uh, it sounds like after the fact, the city went back in July and then got the vote needed. And so I'm concerned about that as well and interested in any comment that the council may have on that. Based on recommendation from bond council, there was a reaffirmation of the prior vote statute allows you to make sure that that majority super majority vote occurs within six months of the public hearing so april to july or within the six months we have reaffirmed based upon a bond council recommendation so we've got the seven zero we got more than the three-fourths vote that was necessary so the project can move forward without a super majority that is a super majority no but in the projects um started before July and so the work started before then so how was that possible without the supermajority to move forward with the work the majority vote occurred within six months as authorized by statute okay so in that 
public hearing in July, there was no notification to property owners that a vote would be taking place at that meeting. Was that not required? The notice for the first public hearing was given, and you can, that that public notice is adequate. Yes. So the they, public notice, though, was for an April hearing, but not for a July hearing. That so wasn't a public hearing in July. That the vote took place a at a council meeting, yeah. so that wasn't public. The council or, meetings are all noticed, so the meeting yeah, was Yeah, noticed. but that wasn't on the agenda. It wasn't a public hearing, did not require individual notice. We'd already had the public hearing we had ran okay. the All right. Just like this hearing tonight is a continuation of a prior public Right. Meeting. We were given notice that the meeting was taking place, so. All right. Thank you. Are there input as part of the public hearing? Council input as part of the public hearing? <clears throat> I would just say that uh, it was helpful to hear from the owners and uh, when this started and uh, it was good that the council looked at the our policy and our procedures for special assessment I think we have a, a better special assessment procedure now than we had and so all of this has um, been beneficial to the city of Marshall and I think it's going to benefit commercial and industrial property in the future and even residential property in the future so because of the actions that were taken by citizens and the Ways and Means Committee and city staff and, and the council, uh, I think we're in a better position now than we were before. And uh, it's because uh, I think the city council has tried to listen to the concerns of citizens and, and uh, we're not trying to hide anything. We're just trying to do the best job we can and we want to be fair to all of the property owners. And uh, I think the amounts that we came up with tonight are, are fair amounts and uh, they're quite substantially different than what was proposed before. And so uh, we, we did listen to the citizens. We, we did our homework. And, and we, I also want to recognize the, the city attorney who put a lot of time and effort into this to make sure we're in compliance with city law or state law and, and federal law. And uh, so it was, a, it was a team effort on the part of the city council. And uh, I think we've got a, a, a better procedure because of it. And again, we're trying to be fair to all the citizens. And, and uh, all of us work together on this. So um, I, I, I'm looking forward to what happens in the future. And I think uh, hopefully uh, property owners in, in the future will be satisfied with what their special assessments are. And I would like to second what Glenn said, because I know Brian and you and I visited way back in May, June about this. And I believe that the special assessment is much better than it was. And we appreciate your work on it, Glenn. And this will benefit, you know, as commercial businesses, it does benefit because we went from 100% to approximately 50%. So your assessments have been cut back to originally where Glenn proposed them way back in April, correct, Glenn? Correct. And at that time, you guys agreed to those. You said, yeah, that looks good. And I know at that time, you guys did not own your business. Schwann still owned it. So I'm sure Schwann's is close to you at the time there's a special assessment coming on your building when you purchased it. I mean, I hope they did. So um, in that sense, I think it, it, it is well. I think we have a good special assessment policy now for commercial built businesses other input as part of the public hearing Craig thank you and, and I want to just echo what what Glenn and Jim have said and, and I want to say that we did hear the inputs you know from the affected properties we really did and and if you remember back to those meetings even back into April the discussions about special assessments the push was to completely get rid of them and so that was one of the options that was looked at and it was seriously considered and looking at the ability for funding, the different options that are available, and to be expeditious with projects, that wasn't really realistic at this point in time. There's a, that's a way bigger step that's going to take an awful lot more work than even happened with this. And this was an extraordinary amount of work that was put in by a number of individuals. And, and a Glenn, uh, again, Glenn Barracoler and, and our attorney did an, did an amazing job and spent an awful lot of time on this. And I do think it's equitable. I mean, is it is it still a lot of money? Sure it is. Absolutely. I mean, I look at those numbers. I know how big those numbers are, and I, and I understand what they mean. But I also know that there's, there's times that we do improvements to our property, invest in as a business. I've now become a business owner myself, and, and I get that. And sometimes I have to spend $100 to gain $20, but it keeps my business moving forward. And, you know, I, I don't know what the other answer is, but I do believe that this is equitable. And, and looking at the, at the numbers on the... Uh, 
the assessment or the appraisal that was done, you know, and we have those and we're taken under guidance to, to hold on to them based on what happens in the future because we have to represent the city strongly as a council. The numbers, the numbers are solid. Very well, much part of hearing. Yep. Am I able to go on? Yes, of course. Do I have to reintroduce myself? No, go ahead. Well, <laughs> yeah. uh, I guess I haven't heard yet, you know, who has showed me that it is of a con, um, incre increased benefit to the property owner, uh, it, you know, I, I agree that I, you know, if it has increased my benefit, I got a bill to pay. And I guess I just haven't seen anything here that, uh, determines, you know, that there was an increase in value. So uh, I just, I would like somebody to show me your opinion of that. I know these guys have worked their hearts out, getting the calculations and doing all that, but I haven't seen uh, how it is decided what benefit is this to each of us. And short of an individual property appraisal that likely there would have that individual cost that would need to be once again shared by the property owner mm -hmm. or the city, uh, short of that, you know, that answer will probably never be absolutely known. That's an interesting statement in and of itself. Uh, yeah, I, I just yeah, feel as though somewhere along the way someone is needs to tell us what is our benefit I you know my current assessment I know how we came to that number and if if it's shown to me that that's how much my new benefit is and it's increased the value of my property uh, it seems I should get my checkbook out but I haven't seen that part yet so well I think I you know I'll and I, I understand where you're coming from, but I think part of the benefit is having good infrastructure. I think it was about two, three council meetings ago I brought up the fact, that, and, and we have a home up in Duluth too, my daughters live up there. They had five water main breaks in one day in their city. And that stuff, you don't know about the, that infrastructure. And what is the cost to your business if we break a water main? Let's say Marshall breaks three in one day. Mm -hmm. They choose not to fix yours until the other two are fixed. And you're shut down for three days. You know, that's the benefit, and it, it's hard to balance that benefit, mm -hmm. but that's the benefit of having good infrastructure and good roads. So I agree with the mayor, unless you do individual appraisals, it's hard to come up with, but, but think of it that way, with good mm -hmm. infrastructure, you have, reli or you have reliable mm -hmm. infrastructure to your building. There's a value there. If we don't do that, and you're out of water for three days, you know, what yeah. is that cost there? Yeah. I, I spent some time looking at your, at all those properties out there, on Google Earth to try to get my head around the project, looking at the driveway aprons and trying to figure out where the costs and the values are and the narrowing of the street and you know, looking at all the things up and then what Jim talked about at the buried infrastructure because that's the one thing that usually never gets counted and that's a lot of times what drives the points or the value of, of putting one project ahead of the other is what's that buried infrastructure look like and how critical is that. For one, we get the benefit of sharing that cost with the municipal utilities, which you're paying for too. It's just, you know, it's a different mm -hmm. tax or a different fee. But there's value added there by participating and cooperating in those projects. And then I look and I see private property improvements. And you're in the business of transport trailers, and those trailers come in either loaded or empty. Mm -hmm. And like this spring, if you've got a trailer that comes in loaded or empty, you don't want to dolly it down in your gravel lot. So you have really nice concrete dolly pads. You've got 485 feet of those, roughly. They're probably six feet wide. It's probably $22,000 worth of concrete to put that in if you put those in today. Now, how do you measure the value of those? You know what they're worth and you know what happens if you don't put them in. Mm -hmm. But how do, you, how do you make that tangible back to your business? And that's like 
I'm going to spend a few thousand dollars along with my neighbors paving our alley and our driveways. I'm probably not going to add that value to my home, but I certainly will to my quality of, of being on the property. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I, I would be interested in the appraisal just to help me quantify, you know. I, and and I, I'm really I, hoping, I, and I know that at a point in time, we're going to share that information. We won't hold that private because it's not private but it's strategic i guess for lack of a better term is we don't know how this plays and we have to represent the city i don't know how else to put that is that sure. is that a fair assessment mr mayor one of the difficulties on this is that there's it isn't just we sense it isn't just the assessments there's discussion about the process that we used in terms of how we went about the public hearing process the super majority vote and there's also um, some indication that 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 no matter what validation we used via these methods, that it's not legal in the end. That's the sense I get out of some correspondence and communication we've had with with um, with some of the owners here. And so, part of the difficulty for us is if we answer one, does it does it does it mean the other two are solved? And, and so we've reduced the assessments mm -hmm. nearly in half, and here we are. And I sense that the, 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 the assessments that are on this sheet, that's what we believe the benefit to be. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're recommending the council to approve. Our, our answer to what is the benefit mm -hmm. is what's on that sheet. And we had the methods validated by an appraiser. So that's, that's kind of the that's, difficulty. You know, before I pay the bill, I'd love to see that, you know. And I know you guys have worked hard, and we spend money yep. on our own stuff. And, you know, and I don't have any problem with that. that. I'm not interested in a 5-2 vote for an 8-0 vote. That, that's with the other not two, the point. With the other two items. You know, I just, this here... No longer be an I, issue. It had helped me make a good decision. Okay, thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Thank you. Any other input as part of the public hearing? I make a motion to close the public hearing. Motion. Second. Motion by Jim, seconded by Craig. Discussion? If there's no discussion, we'll move to a vote. Close the voting. Motion does pass. We'll now move then to the next agenda item, which is to consider the resolution um, that would adopt the assessment. Questions about the resolution? I move approval of the resolution. Motion by Jim. Is there a second to that motion? It was actually by me. Oh, excuse me. Motion by Craig. I'm sorry. I'll second it. Seconded by Jim. Discussion? <laughs> So, in listening to everybody, I think I can't reiterate what everybody else has said. It's been a lot of work, a lot of man hours, a lot of research. I can't imagine how much time Glenn Bearcoller spent on it. I think we did our due diligence. I will say for the record, I hate taxes, but they're a necessary evil. And when I was thinking about the discussion and I'm thinking about value, I think about when I moved to Marshall 15 years ago when I was buying my house. I assumed there would be a good road. I assumed there would be good infrastructure. Did I check to see how old the road was and the value added? I have to say I didn't. When I think about that going forward, will I? I don't know, you know? I know I'll, will, yeah. I'll, I'll consider whether I live on a gravel road or a paved road, but then when, if it is a gravel road and the value of that house is enough for me to live on, am I gonna say, you pave that road, homeowner, or I'm not going to buy it, I probably won't be buying a house. You have to make those just decisions. And I think, again, we've all done a really good job, and we spent a lot of time, and Council Member Lazinski and I were totally against, you know, special assessments and all for a different thing. Are we where we need to be ultimately and perfectly? 
No, but I think for now we've gotten to a good place and a better place than where we were before. So I'm going to be voting for this. Is it perfect? No. Is it the best we can do right now? Yes. Other discussion on the motion, John? So as much as I'd like to take a vote on this, I will be abstaining on this one. You know, to comment on your comment, Steve, infrastructure is something, when I, when I do buy a house, we do look, because I bought a lot of property, one of the things we look for is a good road and a good sidewalk. And I'll use an example, my daughter is buying a home now that is on a terrible road, and it affected the offer we made on the house, because we assume in the next five years she will have an assessment. So it is something people look at when they buy houses and buy properties. Um, if they don't, they should. That's something that I, I have learned to look at. So it is wise to do that. In, in, in Marshall, we don't have as many issues as other cities because we take care of our roads, our infrastructure. It does cost money, but we have very good infrastructure and good roads. So, Other discussion on the motion? If not, we'll move to a vote. Close the voting. Motion does pass. We'll note the one abstention. Moving forward, then, agenda. Yes, yes Dennis. The, now that that um, assessment has been set, you now have 30, if, if you want to continue with the appeal, you have 30 days to serve the city clerk, 10 days after that to file with the district court. So the, the, the clock now starts ticking for that process. Thank you, Dennis. And th thank you for the effort and the energy that, you know, to come in here and represent yourselves. I really do appreciate and respect that. I know the whole council does. Thank you. Move then to agenda item number five. This is the East Lyon Street um, project. This is a public hearing on the improvement. Once again, I'll call on Glenn Olson to conduct this public hearing. Thank you, Mayor and Council. If we can bring up the map. This project. Um, is just southeast of Trunk Highway 23, um, and it goes from Trunk Highway 23 to just short of the city limits. It actually uh, terminates uh, just past the driveway to, to Vast. Um, the project includes uh, a regrading of sorts and um, asphalt pavement no curb and gutter, uh, driveway uh, approaches if necessary. If the driveway approach is in good shape, we wouldn't uh, do an improvement there. We also have calculated the approximate uh, special assessment dollar amounts. That's not something that's required for the, for the uh, project hearing, but it is important. It's kind of the one thing people are wondering about, so we've given them an estimate of that. Uh, you can see on the, on the overhead that there are two major commercial properties on the north side and one large residential property on the south side. And when we went to the uh, public informational meeting that we had with the property owners, it was an invitation for them to come in and, and take a look at what the project scope was and what we plan to do and the approximate cost. Um, we did utilize the new special assessment methods, the three-way uh, test and the uh, recommended low amount of those three. And th one significant difference to that was the residential property on the south side. Um, and I need to just digress just a minute. The property owners that had not petitioned for the, for the project but requested the project uh, were um, Dr. Laporte and his wife and Vast, just in discussion. So we went forward and we put this together. And um, the Laportes indicated that they were thinking that it would cost them about $30,000 for their participation in the project without really any input from us. And when they heard that the maximum residential assessment was $5,700, she was just thrilled. 
<laughs> she, she was just thrilled. And I said, well, we need to discuss that because we as staff didn't think that was fair, just like we didn't think it was fair for the industrial properties to pay the $166 a foot. We didn't think that was, uh, they, they all have about the same frontage, about 300 feet, give or take, uh, of, of each of the properties along the project. And for us to suggest that $5,700 uh, maximum for that property with a pasture next to it and a very large, large residential property in the city of Marshall was fair, I just said I didn't think it was. And so we indicated what we had proposed to be a fair amount, and it was over $21,000. And uh, they looked at me and said, that's fair. Um, and so I did indicate to them that if in fact they thought it was fair for them to fill out what we have as a waiver uh, to indicate that they would be willing to pay up to that amount and they brought that in. I think you might have a copy of that uh, waiver in your, in your file. This isn't typical uh, for this point in a project, but because it was so significant and I didn't want to have any misunderstanding with the owners uh, what, what that dollar amount should be, could be, uh, we, we used the, both the methods that we used for uh, commercial property as well. We used a front foot average calculation of 80 feet per residential property, and theirs ended up being about 3.68 times that. I can't remember the exact number uh, for frontage. We also then compared the square footage. If you'd use square footage, it'd be about 11 times what the average residential 10,000 square foot property would be. So. It, it, was the, it was the lower amount of those two uh, assessment procedures. Um, th they were, they had had problems over many years with dust, rough, rough roads, and really living in the city of Marshall, they said, we'd like to have some benefit too, and they were willing to pay that. We did not call this a new construction project we called it reconstruction so that we could that we could use the same formulas for reconstruction here as we did in the industrial park project for commercial industrial properties. So that's where we came up with the proposed assessment amounts. Uh, the the uh, special assessments for this project uh, were significantly m more than they would be if we had to use $5,700. But both of us thought it was fair for that property and fair for the businesses across the street that all of a sudden they didn't have to pay an additional amount for that either. Uh, we do have two significant pro uh, adjacent areas that are outside the city limits that are not, we, we can't put an assessment on those properties, but we can, if in fact they develop in the future, have some sort of connection fee if we discuss that in advance. But that's for a future date. Um, this project, because it was developed by the city, uh, and Dennis, uh, explain if I'm wrong, uh, does need the supermajority to go forward as well. So keep that in mind when you have discussion on that. Okay, thank you, Glenn. Open up for input as part of the public hearing. Steve. Thank uh, you, Council, for before, taking time. Before you start, uh, yep. Kyle, is the pointer available? Okay. Sorry about that. Right. Go ahead. No problem. Steve Klein, uh, owner of Klein Foods. We are uh, the uh, property, if you have the map handy. There we go. We are the uh, property owner uh, closest to the corner, right over there, uh, 1501 East Lyon. Uh, <clears throat> we had a long informative discussion last <laughs> week regarding the uh, scope of this project 
and um, we've given some thought to what we learned here. If I remember correctly, and Glenn, you may uh, correct me on this, but I believe your initial thoughts were that our, our assessment was in the neighborhood of 25,000? Yes. Is that right? Uh, after the three methods were reviewed. Right, right, yep. right. Um, <coughs> at this time, uh, we're going to oppose this project. We've tried to uh, do some calculations to see if this uh, could be anywhere in that neighborhood of benefit uh, to us. Um, for our particular situation, we don't see any additional uh, revenue from additional traffic or uh, more people coming to us. Uh, yes, there will be some uh, additional value to our property. We don't think it will be 25000 at this time. However, if this was part of a more comprehensive plan where property between us and independent lumber was going to be annexed into the city and be developed, or property between us and Highway 19 was going to come in and be developed, our perspective would be entirely different because this most likely would establish a much stronger traffic pattern that would be of benefit to us. Uh, I have visited with a couple of uh, members. Um, if this project goes ahead, this would be the fourth time in 10 years that our corner was torn up. Uh, first one for uh, the redoing of Highway 23 bypass. Uh, second one for the bike path. Last year for the J-turns. And every time uh, we take a significant uh, hit uh, from our residential or from our retail business. So it's not that we're totally against this project, but we'd like to uh, see a much more comprehensive plan to see where it would really bring that much value to us in our particular case. Uh, the three of us are all good neighbors. We try and be good neighbors over there. And uh, <clears throat> so I'm a little hesitant to to speak in, in opposition to this particular project uh, because we want to get along. We are trying to work hard to make a uh, real growing business out there. And at this time, that 25000 could be uh, much better spent in terms of expansion projects for our particular business. So that is my uh, uh, opinion on this. And I'll be willing to answer any questions if you have them. Hey, thank you, Steve. I have a quick question. How much? Of a hit do you take in your walk-in business during each closure? It depends on the size of the uh, project. For instance, the the uh, Highway 23 project, that shut us down almost the entire summer. Uh, so I would say that was probably 30% at least. Uh, the bike path was not nearly as uh, obstructive, uh, so there probably was 5%. Last year, uh, with all the rain, it was supposed to be a Somewhat shorter project, but uh, started on August 13th, did not conclude until day before Thanksgiving. Uh, I would say we lost at least 25% for our annual revenue, just based on uh, what was happening last year, so. So my question, Steve, would be, where do people park? I mean, when the bike path was ripped up, they could still get in your parking lot. When 23 yep. was parked, they'd come this way and come in that way. Where would be the proposed blend for people to park at Vast or in a Walnut Grove Market now? That, that um, discussion was held at the informational meeting and we had a real good conversation with Steve and Vast concerning the possibility when this driveway was closed, if it was uh, during the concrete process, there's always a seven day process. Uh, there's a possibility of a connection between these two parking lots for tentative uh, construction access. Uh, we did say that there would be very little time, if any, when there would be not access. In the previous J-Turn project, it was really significant because there was a full detour set up that came around 19 and down uh, a township road, I believe, through the yes. backside. It was very difficult to get to the property. We do not intend to close this access during construction except for very brief periods of time. And, you know, I, I call it that, you know, very brief periods of time are days, not weeks. Um, but that can happen when we're paving through the area. It'll shut down for that 
period of time where they lay the asphalt through there and compact it and let it cool for a while. So uh, we, we had a real significant discussion about the ability to get uh, traffic here or around the driveway, uh, gravel at, at some time. Um, so that was one issue we wanted to address with both Steve and, and the council is, is construction access uh, required in the project would keep him open on a regular basis, not closing it off. So Steve, I just have a question. Did sure. you talk to Vince about this when he brought up the idea of pushing this forward? And well, it was a little bit of a surprise how this developed. Uh, earlier this winter, someone uh, was out in our yard putting in flags again, and I walked out to talk to him, find out what was going on, and uh, it was uh, someone from the city who was doing some locating and indicated that they were locating in advance of proposing this particular project. That was the first I had ever heard about it. Uh, <clears throat> later, Vince and I talked about it somewhat. Uh, at that, his initial indication to me was, you know, he thought he'd be comfortable with seven or eight thousand dollars, possibly under ten thousand uh, dollars, and that was uh, later this winter already when we had that discussion. We were pushing somebody out of the corner stuck in the snow there while we had that, but uh, <clears throat> that was the last basically that we have discussed in terms of how much they'd be willing to pay or what we'd be willing to pay or what our thoughts were about it, so. One, one, more one, one more item that we had was we had a discussion of length of assessment uh, time and approximate cost. And um, we had estimated the interest to be about that 4.96% uh, because we had a previous bond. The, the indication since then, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is, is it'll probably be reduced to 2% and extended for 10 years if the property owners wish that with the understanding that it could always be paid in full at any time. So that might not sway your decision-making process, but we're trying to reduce the cost to the property owners as much as possible. Right. That, that's kind of new information even for you tonight. Yes, it is. So, any further questions? Steve, um, do you have any problems in the wintertime with, with the road presently the way it is? Well, <laughs> um, I would say the biggest problem this winter was DOT. They do not have an effective plan for <coughs> snow removal uh, with this J-turn or our corner. Um, the day, the Tuesday that we were supposed to get one inch and we got nine inches, I saw a car in the ditch at every U-turn for every J-turn along uh, Highway 23. Uh, so our biggest problem in terms of snow removal or access is the corner and uh, what DOT does regarding that. Uh, I'm not sure if I understand correctly, the township does the grading on that road, is that correct? Uh, that was entirely new to the road grader uh, that was doing it and uh, it was quite the mess there this morning primarily on the corner. Once you get beyond the corner, there's no problem. Pending, I mean, we know this winter was a difficult winter. Right. And, and I know we can't judge last year or prior years because of the j -term, but typically, do you have a problem with customers getting into your facility during the winter? No. Did everybody, you and a representative from Bast and a representative from the Port family, all have a chance to get together at one time in these public meetings, and did you all attend? Yes, we all attended uh, to the, the informational meeting, yes. And is the new information you just received as far as, you know, a drawn-out payment and a 2%, would that have a change in your agreeing or disagreeing with the project? Well, I think uh, at the informational meeting, Glenn indicated that uh, there are situations where these assessments can be stretched out over time, basically tied to the length of the bond that underwrites them. 
uh, and at that time we were talking in the 4% range. I don't know if the 2% really is going to change our mind that much at the moment. Uh, but as I said, this is our feeling at the moment. If this is part of a bigger plan where more things are coming into the city, our perspective on this is entirely different. And did you have yeah, well, and mine's, mine's right along the same lines as John. When I guess my question to you is, is I mean, I don't want to, there's three owners here. And I don't want to stick this down anybody's throat. And I don't want it to feel like it's going down anybody's throat. It's not like you don't have a road here. You have a road here. I mean, I've gone to Vast. I've come to your your business a handful of times. My wife and my family's home, and it's not the end of the it's not the end of the world. You know, I mean, we can that little bit of gravel is tolerable, and and obviously it's not a it's not a major thing. It's not a lot different than a lot of alleys in town, but I think it is an improvement. But it's got to be an improvement that's that's acceptable or desirable. To you folks, and I don't know of anything coming close here. It's not, I don't think, in our near plan for a project to come in to say, well, you know, we're going to build this because trust right. us, we're going to put something in. Because it's not, I don't see it there on the horizon. Well, the and reality, we don't either. So with the, uh, the larger comprehensive plan that would involve additional development and uh, annexation would also probably involve an improvement to the very street that we're talking about. It right. probably would have to have curbing gutter and right. different types of We'd be turning it all up anyway. Yeah. Right. So. So. so, yeah, and I guess that, that's my question to you is, is if, you're, if you're opposed today, this week on it, I mean, that, that affects my vote. Okay, well, today we remain opposed, but in the future, uh, if this became part of a much bigger plan, our perspective would be entirely different. Any other input as part of the public hearing? Uh, uh, Glenn, um, on, our, on the sheet that we have here, it, it shows the uh, the road going past the entryway to the vast and goes, I assume it goes to the end of the lot line. Is that why it went further? Or? No, it, it really doesn't. The transition is before that. They actually own more property to the east there. Okay. But you went past their driveway. Yeah, and, and there's a sanitary sewer manhole and a uh, MMU uh, water fire hydrant uh, there, and we wanted to pave past that. Okay, that's the reason for going beyond the driveway. Yep, yep. So okay. then show me, just for my mind okay. and for anybody in the audience, where okay. is the city limits? City limits is off the right-hand side. Okay, and what about on the other side? Uh, city limits right. just goes around Doc Laporte's. So his is, his is everything in. in there is city limits. This is out. And this, so, is, so is this access road to the old tower that used to be there. Right there. That's outside that's the out. city. Yep, that's Just out. this property line here and then that line, or does it come no, over to the No, all field? the way through the pasture. Through the pasture. All Laporte's property. Okay. Well, I'm sad that he's not here because I would have had questions. Well, they were out, out of town and they came up and they uh, provided that. Did they get, did you get a cop? I yeah. know. Go, go ahead and. So that what any further is. questions? Thank you, Steve, for yep. your input. Um, any other new input as part of the public hearing? Uh, could I just make a comment here? Um, uh, Glenn, you talked about their, their property, and it's not the typical $5,700 assessment. <laughs> and you made modifications to it. Yeah. And I think there's uh, John DeKramer and, and uh, others have indicated that you know the Ways and Means Committee needs to be looking at the special assessment policy and tweaking it for residential where we have multiple lots and where we have larger than normal lots. And so yes. it's my understanding that uh, staff and the Ways and Means Committee will be looking at that in the future. So mm -hmm. this is kind of in line with what, what the Ways and Means Committee, I think, will be looking at. So as the council considers the um um, the action on this public hearing, one option would be to close the public hearing and then it would move to a vote on the resolution that would order the improvement. And as has been discussed, that takes a super majority vote. The other option would be, and then, then it would be one way or another, either it passes or the project is um, stopped at that point. The other option, I believe, and Dennis, you can correct me on this, would be if it is the desire of the um, Council that the three property owners have once again some additional discussion just to affirm that everybody is still of the same opinion, either in favor or not in favor of that. Because I think what I hear Council Member Schaefer saying is that 
unusual project. We have three owners. We want everybody to right. agree to the project. We don't want to force a project that one third or more of the project owners <coughs> really don't want. The, um, so if that was the case, if we wanted time for that additional discussion, I believe we could continue this public hearing. And and Mr. Mayor, I think that's an excellent idea because if, if all three property owners were in agreement to move this project forward, I'm certainly in favor of it. But if any project owner or any pro property owner is, is adamantly opposed to it, then I'm not in favor of it. And I don't, I don't believe I stand alone on that. And again, we're in, in the public hearing, so any other input on that direction? Um, I just have a couple things here. I mean, to me, there's two questions here. One is, are the improvements necessary? I mean, should we be making these improvements? The second one is the amount of the assessments. Um, I, I think that people are certainly uh, willing to have the improvements and would like the improvements. It, it's just a question, is it a matter of whether or not the assessment is the fair amount or not? And so I, I think to me there are two issues here, whether or not we should do the improvements and, and whether they're necessary. And the second one is what, what's the correct amount of the assessments? I look with the three property owners, you want to be careful. We extend the conversation. I think the three property owners have made clear what their positions are. So I don't want the property owners to say, well, he said we can't. She said, you know, get into a, a disagreement. Like you said, see if you guys all get along, but you were a little apprehensive because you oppose us and the other two don't oppose it. So, I, you know, I, it's one of these where I think we already know what the positions of the property owners are. So I guess I would make a motion to close the public hearing and move forward with it. So I make a motion to close the public hearing. Motion by Jim. Second. Seconded by Craig to close the public hearing. Discussion on that motion? If not, we'll move to a vote. Close the voting. And the motion does pass. We'll then move then to the Agenda item number six, this is the resolution that would order the improvement and the preparation of the plans. Questions about this resolution? Not, I would entertain a motion. Call for that three times. Is there a motion on the resolution? Is there a motion on the resolution? If not, that, uh, Resolution dies for lack of a motion. We'll move on then to agenda item number seven, or excuse me, agenda item number eight. This is the Heron Road, Superior Road Reconstruction Project. Uh, once again, we'll have a public hearing on this improvement, Glenn. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Maybe bring up the map again for the, uh, for the improvement area. Uh, this is the map showing the continued reconstruction of Superior Road. Also, the installation of water main only on Huron Road from Superior to Trunk Highway 23. Uh, that had been specifically requested from Marshall Municipal Utilities as a result of significant number of water breaks along that section. Um, we had brought forward originally as a reconstruction project and after discussions on the Michigan uh, Superior Project, we had decided to cut that back to just the water main on Huron. Uh, the assessments, uh, there would be no assessments on Huron, only on the Superior Road portion of the project. Uh, the Superior Road portion of the project is total reconstruction with water, sewer, and storm sewer uh, improvements made along that street. Do you have any questions? I'd, yeah, thank, you, thank you, Glenn. Open up for input as part of this public hearing. John. Question, you said there would be no assessments on Huron? Huron Road. Why would that be? Because there is no uh, improvements other than the water main replacement, which MMU pays 100%. Okay, so the uh, Huron is not then a complete, you're not recommending a complete reconstruction, you're only doing that? That's correct. We did originally recommend, uh, but when we reviewed it uh, with wastewater, they indicated that there's probably 10 years life left in that section and uh, would not require 
reconstruction if it was opposed. So, uh, just kind of, you know, point, okay, if we do not do it now, and that water main expecting to last 40 plus years. Mm -hmm. So when it does come time to do that row, just their expectation is then that the city will be picking up a much greater share of that at that time because with our new assessment policy and the lack of MMU being partic participating in that, so we would be picking up a much greater cost at some point in time in the future. Sure, and the property owners would too. Yeah. Now, the, right. the issue here is that, oh. uh, let's, let's go exactly what would most likely happen. MMU would come in and replace a 10-foot strip next to the south curb, put in new water main, leave the existing one in place till that was hooked up so it maintained water supply during the construction part of the project. It would generally be a 10-foot wide strip next to the curb and gutter, put in new uh, and a new uh, asphalt layer and base put over the top of that uh, water main. In the future, then when you need to replace the rest, uh, then you would take out the rest. And let's say that that's 40 feet wide and 10 feet was water and 10 feet was sewer. That's, that's 20 feet. The rest of the reconstruction essentially would come from to the property owners. And we would then, let's say it was 10 years from now, most likely when we replace the surfacing for that, we would mill and overlay the original 10 year old project as well. So we had a constant new surface to work with even though the south part was 10 years old. So there would be some additional costs in doing it in the future but uh, that's the process that we would use. Uh, we, we did talk with the, the veterinary clinic about the potential for assessments as well. And they, uh, their access is from here on road. At this time, there would be no assessments to that. On the Superior Road part, they do have a, a sewer service line that comes from Superior to the house that's located, okay, just one, uh, to, to the house that's located here. There's a sewer service that comes down there. So they do have a minor assessment, proposed six, $700 uh, for that. But otherwise it's borne by the adjacent industrial users. Russ? Glenn, you met with the property owners on March 18th and provided them the documentation for assessments and, and what was the feedback? They understood that it would be now according to the new procedure. We did not get any significant uh, feedback. As a matter of fact, in developing the project, I'll give you an example. Carlson Stewart that has a fairly large operation going on there. Uh, uh, we talked about their driveways and they have three of them now and specifically we talked about are those driveways where you want them the width that you want them do you want them changed and they said yes we uh, want to reconsider the locations and widths of those driveways uh, they have a fenced in area on the north side of their building they would like a driveway straight out from that they maybe would eliminate a middle driveway that right now they just use for parking. They park on the driveway itself because they have a lot of employees that come at different times of the day and they don't want them to be blocked in. So that, that's a parking spot for the, those people. That's the kind of discussion we had. Uh, Schwann's was there, all the property owners participated in the, in the project and our major discussions was Where's my access going to be? Uh, when you come through here and you redo those, can we keep one driveway open? Can these two properties share a driveway during construction? Those are the kinds of things they were talking about. So they were looking at really how could the project be developed so that I'm not out of business. 
second question, Glenn, is that a continuation of the, the street being narrower? Yes. Any opposition from the property owners that way? Not at the meeting. And it we did discuss up. that specifically because it was brought up at a previous meeting. The intent is to make it narrower, the costs smaller for everybody, and it, it would extend the driveways somewhat on each side to go in there. But we did uh, address that in the first part on the south side too. All of the driveway costs were not assessed to the property owners because of the shrinking of the buildings, or the street as well. Their input as part of the public hearing? At your public meeting, you know, you, you talked about design of the project. What was the feeling on assessments? Because what we're hearing back from the public time and time again is that they're not happy with the assessments. In this meeting, you just discussed that, yeah, they may get a $30,000, $40,000 assessment. What is the feedback? I mean, there's nobody here. Jason, do you remember any adverse feedback? We, we did indicate uh, the new method of assessment. And they certainly like that a lot better than 100% of the per foot cost. <coughs> and it reduced it probably by half. So there was no adverse uh, discussion about the new proposed methods of assessment. It was more centered around project development. So it, it really boils down to whether you make the improvements now or 10 years from now. <coughs> And um, if you make them now, there's going to be some, some savings because of MMU's involvement. It'll cost a little bit more later, but then they get 10 years delay in payment. Yep. So that, that's the, really the choice. Yep. Any other input? Yes, yeah, sure. Comment on that, that section of MMU. <coughs> I think we did an estimate on the cost of that, and it, and it would be, and Jason's not listening, but I think we said it would be like 30000 Did we not? on that that <laughs> that section of uh because we're not reconstructing or getting participation by mmu later on we kind of equated it to about thirty thousand. i don't recall but uh, i think circuit kramer was right, right on where he said <coughs> the city will incur more costs to do a reconstruct later but the utility is not participating it'll cost everyone more but the assessment policies will still cap the property owner and and I think we kind of equated it to today's dollars it would be about thirty thousand dollars on that one-third section that MMU is doing it's not a huge amount uh, the bigger amount is we are taking on more on the general levy because of the new assessment policy <coughs> it's reducing these commercial industrial property owners assessments it's it's a, larger impact on our levy if I can jump in the the impact on what we previously talked about superior road uh, the earlier part of superior road uh, and Michigan Road that was more of a significance because it was also the wastewater that was involved surface and, water and surface water okay. so that took up then a bigger share where this 30,000 uh, roughly that you're talking about is really just MMUs, just the water main portion. Is that correct? Right. For, okay. for Huron. Yeah, yeah, for Huron. Yeah, not for right. Superior, but right. for Huron. Okay. Other input as part of the public hearing? I move we close the public hearing. Second. Motion by Craig, seconded by Jim to close the public hearing. Discussion on that motion? If not, we'll move to a vote. the voting motion does pass we'll move then to the next agenda item which would be the here and road superior road reconstruction project the resolution that would order the improvement and preparation of the plans I move the resolution I'll second motion by Craig second by John discussion if not we'll move to a vote close the voting Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, yeah. Can you reopen? Um, they want to weigh on my computer. I don't know where I went. Were you fast mousing? No. <laughs> I don't know. They want to yeah, weigh speaking over there. Yeah. Speed mouse. Speed mouse. Speedy Gonzales. Speedy Gonzales. Yeah. See ya. 
Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Get <it> refreshing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, I'm like Chicago. I voted six times. We're still okay, right, Kyle? We'll re yeah. Reopen the vote. Everyone vote in. I'll close the voting. The motion does pass. Moving on then to agenda item. Number 10, this is also here in Road, Superior Road Reconstruction Project. This would be the resolution approving the plan specification and ordering the advertisement for the bids. Is there a motion? I'll make that motion. Motion by John, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Craig. Discussion? If not, we'll move to a vote. Can we do a voice vote on this one, please? All in favor of the, this? Signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Uh, we have the vote? Yes. That motion does pass. We'll move then to the consent agenda. We'll bring the items up on the screen that are on the consent agenda this mm -hmm. evening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just a clarification of the li East Lion Street one. Uh, if, in fact, they come forward with a petition for improvement, uh, that would start the process again. If they have that discussion, uh, between the property owners, the petition for improvement would be with all three property owners would reinitiate it. That, they certainly have that right. Yeah. 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 Thank you. No, thank you. On the consent <laughs> agenda, the items on the consent agenda this evening include the resolution uh, regarding the FCC Form 394, the consent of, to the assignment or transfer of the control of the cable trans television franchise, uh, consider the approval of the refuse hauler license for Southwest Sanitation and Waste Management, consider the authorization to approve Frontline Plus Inc. Warning Systems uh, Division contract with the City of Marshall, consider the authorization to declare vehicles as surplus property for the Marshall Police Department. Uh, the Anderson edition, the introduction of the plat calling for the hearing, uh, declaring equipment surplus from the Parks Department, consider the purchase of the GPS uh, for the Engineering Department, and then finally consider the approval of the bills and the project payments. So is there any item on the consent agenda any member of the council wants to remove for purposes of further discussion? Number 17, please. Number 19. Any other item? Wait a minute, excuse me, 17. Uh, I'm looking at the old old one here. So, yes, 17 has already been pulled. That's what I really Okay, so we'll pull only Sorry. agenda item number 17. So, we'll, uh, with that item removed from the consent agenda, I would entertain a motion to approve the remaining items on the consent oh, agenda. Second. Sec motion by Jim, seconded by Russ. Discussion? <laughs> if not, we'll move to a vote. Close the voting. The motion does pass. We'll move then to agenda item number 17. Um, John and Russ. I'll let Russ go first. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, had, I had an opportunity when, it, when this appeared on the agenda, I had an opportunity to at first take a look at the trailers and because I, I questioned a trailer, I mean, they were 20 some years old and I just questioned, you know, do we really need to buy a new trailer? So, I had the opportunity to go out and visit with Preston, and he actually showed me one of the two trailers, and and uh, which was a dump trailer. And I and I thank him profusely for taking his time out of his busy day. The other trailer that we could not get in because he's got it in storage and loaded up with various other equipment. But one of the things in our conversation was, can any other department within the city use that trailer or use either one of these trailers? Well, we agreed on the leaf trailer not to be able to be used by anybody else, but you know, not knowing. He did find out that maybe the street department could use that flatbed trailer in, in maybe various things or whatever the case be, but unfortunately they couldn't get into the facility where it was located. So they're going to take a look at it. But uh, I just wanted to bring it up and thank Preston, uh, pull it from the con consent agenda and, and thank Preston for explaining it to me uh, because I wasn't in favor of buying new trailers just to buy new trailers. But when he showed me the, the situation, explained the situation, uh, I guess I'm in favor of it and I thank him for his time. Okay, mine was on the uh, the flower pots. 
So, uh, question: Are these the large flower pots that we had out before? Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, yes, those are the uh, what I'll call terracotta pots that were purchased in 1993. Um, and they're all starting to crack and discolor. And last year we used um, shelter revenue funds from shelter reservations to order all new flower pots. So uh, now are they? I've, yeah. I've threw all of them that are cracked or chipped and we probably have 75 left that are in um, less than favorable condition. But if no one wants them, I'll throw them all in the dumpster. But there might be somebody that wants to buy them. So. I was going to say, if somebody, uh, if somebody that has a business or whatever along one of our streets that wants to get one, I, I'd like to see if they were available for free. Yep. Somebody could get them, provided they plant them with flowers and they put it out and they decorate out on the, the street if they're reasonable shape. Take care of them. Yeah, yeah. and then yep. take care of it, yes. I, I'm fine with that. Yeah. So. Preston, along that, I that's a good idea. Um, does the Downtown Association, have you had any conversation with them? Um, last year was kind of the first year we put pots back downtown. Uh, what we did was, uh, I got to think, make sure I say this correctly here. Uh, we provided the pots. The downtown businesses who were interested in participating put $50 in per pot. And the chamber put in $50 to match because it's $100 per pot. And then we just watered them so to utilize the pots. So we didn't have any cost other than watering. So but the pots that you supplied are these pots or the were these pots? Were these old ones, old ones. yep, they? yep. So now we haven't got to the conversation if we're gonna do that again, but if we give out free flower pots, that might kind of take care of that. Right. So okay. other than they would have to take care of them themselves. Take them out so, in the yep. fall and stuff like that. Yep. Okay. Where we did all that, we put them out, we water them and we dumped them in the fall. So. Would you still water them if they? If they uh, we could. Because a lot of times they don't have a lot of water. But no right, so. yep. I think it might be worthwhile a conversation. Yeah, with it's more so of just making downtown look right. more inviting. Right. So. And one of the things that I just happen to be thinking of uh, uh, around Pipestone, if you drive through there, they have flower pots out in public right of ways, so they're not by a business, but they're obviously taken care of by a business because they've got a sign in it, and they but they're all decorated. They're full of flowers of their choosing. Yep. And make a you know they make it nice in the intersection. So yep. uh, you know if somebody was interested in that, I think that'd be a great idea as well. Yep, we actually talked about that idea last year when we did the um, downtown business association mm -hmm. thing. But since it was the first year, we just thought we kind of kick it off, see how it went, and then we talked about getting you know a stake that said this pot was made available with funds through whoever. Yeah. So say now maybe if they get a free pot, maybe yep. they might kick it off and get it started. So. Yep. Okay. So thank you. Yep. Preston, we've addressed the pots and the um, <laughs> uh, and different, get different kind of pot than some other and the, about, yeah. And the, yeah. the um, utility trailer is removed from the list at this time. With the with that discussion, is there a motion? So moved. I'll second. Motion by Russ, seconded by John. Discussion. If not, we'll move to a vote. Close of voting. Motion passes. Mr. Mayor, is there, a, is there a possibility of moving up the branding proposal agenda item? Um, just a request. We do have some individuals that are on a time constraint. And, uh, we, is and that that's a, a request. I, so with the, uh, unless I hear um, um, reluctance from the council, we'll move up agenda item a number 24, this is the Marshall Community Branding Proposal Acceptance. Sharon, I'll let you introduce and I believe Lauren's coming forward. Yes, um, we have our Convention Visitors Bureau Director, Lauren Deitz, who has since led this process um, after the request for proposals were, were put out and we did receive some proposals. There's two other individuals that uh, have been instrumental in the, in the branding uh, project thus far, and that's Max Rath, who um, has provided some really good insight. And then uh, Glenn Bader, who's from Ralco True Shrimp, and he's been, um, per se, kind of the chairman of the committee, even though he, he has time constraints with his, with his daytime job. But 
uh, they may want to come forward as well and just offer some some support to Lauren as she presents um, the the request. So if, if Lauren and Max and Glenn could come forward, that would be great. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Sorry, I should have given Kyle this earlier, but Okay, so before we get started, um, I just kind of wanted to recap why we are here where we are today, um, why this project is so important to our community, and why we decided to um, get RFPs, for, get some proposals going so that we could get this project underway. So as a community, we, what is our purpose? What do we stand for? Where do we want to go? And what makes Marshall unique? And what do we have that's valuable to our citizens that we aren't addressing now? So as a civic brand might, must be uncovered, identified, co-created, and, and championed by the people who live and work within our community. So this is the situation that we kind of felt Marshall's in. Um, but we believe by defining our story, we're gonna be able to better position ourselves for a bold future in not only uniting our community, but also economic development, job growth, and visitor growth. So, Currently, Marshall is home to numerous entities that kind of occupy a common space, but don't necessarily function together. We kind of operate one-on-one -on -one independently. So through this rebranding process, we believe that our entities can be better connected by a common brand and purpose, maintaining their individuality, but having a common goal for our community. So ultimately, we would strive for these entities in our community to take ownership of this brand, as well as all of the people who live within our, within our city. So as Sharon mentioned, we did receive 21 RFPs from 19 different companies, which was, to be honest, far more than I expected to receive. Um, I was going to be optimistic with 10, so when we got 21, we were very impressed. Um, they ranged anywhere from 270,000 to about 28 to 30,000, so averaging at about 67. Our committee did narrow the field to four, um, and that committee includes people from a bunch of our local businesses, as well as the chamber, EDA. Uh, Glenn from Ralco and then Max as well as kind of an independent marketing consultant for us. So in our round of interviews, we did narrow the field to one. It was kind of a standout from the get-go. From the proposal stage, I think you were the one that said it's the A-team. All the other proposals kind of were put to shame after we read that one. So when we actually got the opportunity to hear their presentation and meet with them one-on-one, -on -one, we were even more impressed with what they had to offer, um, not only for their deliverables, but because of the research that they put into all their projects. So the company that we're recommending for this project is Northstar Destination Creatives. They're actually out of Nashville, Tennessee. Um, although they're not super local, unfortunately we actually didn't receive a lot of Minnesota companies. Um, they had a lot of experience in our area. and. The reason that we chose Northstar, again, I kind of mentioned it before, they're full service. Um, coming into this project, we didn't know if we would have to hire one research company and one branding company. Um, they offered the full spectrum for us. And because they've worked on projects very similar to ours, they understood our goal and what makes us unique. They've worked a lot with communities that have large universities, and they considered SMSU a large university um, for this project, and finding ways that our community can partner together in order to make that a bigger part of our community. And this was, it looks really, um, there's a lot to it, but this was the deliverables they provided for us. And I know both of you kind of mentioned their research side was extremely strong, and I don't know if one of you wanna explain why we thought that their research side especially was Sure. far above everybody else's uh, I'm Glenn Bader thank you for the opportunity um, 
you know, one of the things that I've learned in my years, I spent many years at Schwann's in marketing and now at Relco, and it's probably more through mistakes than successes, but, you know, a really good brand, Marshall. You know, we have a great brand and businesses and people that love to be here. And so the goal of the branding is really to capture that and communicate it well. And, and one of the challenges in marketing, it's easy to like copy other people and come out with a message that really doesn't say anything or doesn't say anything strong. And so, you know, what, what we found through, through the years is we really need to capture that from the people. There's, there's insights that come out of research. So when we listen well, when we engage in conversation and really get people talking about why they love Marshall, why they love doing business in Marshall, um, there's, there's moments where emotion comes out of that. It's usually the moments of emotion where insights are found. And so research in the process was really critical. So finding a group that, that got it, there was a lot of people in, in the proposals that kind of sounded good on paper, but you know, really they hadn't done it well. And so somebody who really understood research and how to kind of pull out what we needed, you know, from the people in our community, but then boil it down to kind of what's the insight, what's kind of that aha aspect that truly captures Marshall. Because what we need to say needs to be different than what everybody else is saying, but it needs to represent who we are. It, it can't be something that, you know, people will look at and not relate and connect to. And so that's really the hardest work. And then coming out of that then is really the, the creative. How do we bring that to life? What does it look like? How do we communicate it? And so we really needed all those things together. And, and I've had the opportunity to work with some, some really good agencies over the past and some not so good ones. You know, and we're in the process right now with True Shrimp, you know, and we've picked it we've picked a really great group they're they're part of they did chick-fil-a's uh, branding and so um you know so we i've had some exposures to, to some great groups and i was a little nervous going into this of what we'd get um and so as we saw the proposals some of them were pretty scary and and north star we had a couple that, that were good and north star just really stood out so i was very pleased with the quality of the work i mean it's something uh, a group we would certainly engage if it were our business and, and I feel good for us as a community uh, recommending uh, this group. Glenn kind of already mentioned it, but these were kind of those key research pieces that they had that were unique to some of the other proposals we saw. Um, community surveys, it, it seems very broad, but that actually is something that not every company looked to do. And um, they also do vision surveys as well as what I thought was unique is the influencer survey. So they actually call some community leaders in other communities. Um, so they would call people from Redwood Falls and Granite Falls and see what their input is of our community as well. Getting that outside view of not only how we see ourselves, but how others see us and how we can be more competitive in the marketplace. So we really thought that that was key to creating a strong brand for our community. And these were interesting. Um, so something that Northstar really focuses on is they want you to address what are some of your goals for your community <clears throat> and how can we track it through this branding. So these were some of the examples that they provided for us, um, whether it was tourism based or economic development. Um, you see increases in tax revenue. You saw all sorts of different goals being achieved post launch of their new brands. Of course, we know there's other impacts to these, but this was how they felt were direct impacts from the projects that they were doing for these communities. So I thought it was really positive to see. Can I add something? Yeah. To that? One, one of the things that was part of their methodology that uh, we appreciated was uh, they used, utilized something called the net promoter score, which is something that's pretty universal out there, but it's a good way to measure any organization or even a community. And you basically ask a question to somebody to say on a scale, of, I think it's one to or zero to 10, um, would you recommend this to somebody else? And you take this, help me Max, I think it's the uh, eight, nine, 10 is positive and zero through six is negative and seven and eight I think is neutral. So you throw out the neutrals, you subtract the negative from the positive and that's your net promoter score. And that becomes a benchmark for you to kind of measure in the future. Are we increasing the likelihood that people would recommend Marshall as, you know, to, to others? And so businesses use that. It's a great indicator. There's a lot of great research that connects it to growth and, and uh, things. So. so that'll be part of the methodology. Um, so you all have seen the proposal, but I just wanted to include the cost and kind of timeline for this project. It is a six month project broken into two phases. Um, the research portion is 20,000 with the rebranding being 30. So 
from the CVB side, we've decided to contribute $10,000 towards this project because we believe in what it could do for our community and our tourism, um, especially tourism. So that would mean that the 40000 would fall to the city. And I know that our original proposal was lower than that, so we wanted to make sure that we explained why this process was the way it was. We kind of anticipated 20000 only covering market research, and this was actually, from a cost perspective, towards the bottom that we saw, it was actually one of the more affordable um, proposals we received. So that was how their cost breakdown and timeline looked. And we did, I did include a few examples. Again, you've seen these, but I just wanted to make sure that we're, if you hadn't, that I brought them forward. So the North Star did do Brookings, South Dakota. I thought this was a nice one because I'm sure many of you could recognize that brand. It's local to us and, and it was one where they really pulled the university into it. They said that, that they really believe in the uh, new ideas, big dreams, and that's where they went with their branding. Another one that North Star did, which I didn't include, is Fargo, North Dakota, and their brand is North of Normal. And this was a big conversation we had in our committee because North Star tends to push you out of your comfort zone. Um, we, we found it hard to believe that somebody in Fargo would call themselves not normal, but they said that that brand just caught like wildfire and now it's all of their races, all of their community events, they really have embraced this abnormally, abnor abnormalities to their community. So we really thought that that was um, something that North Star did that not everybody else did. They, everybody else felt kind of felt fluffy and they, they kept you more in this. Safe. Yes, yes, you, you were, you were going to be okay with the brand because it wasn't pushing you beyond what you already had, where this North Star really uh, worked hard to make sure that you got something new. So this is the Brookings branding. Um, this is actually probably 10 years old now. Um, and it's still very strong in their community. They use it on a, a lot of different um, projects, and you see it all over in Brookings. Another one was Quincy, Illinois. I put this one on here because it was, I thought, probably one of their best brands. Um, it, 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 with this community, they had this historical feel, but they really wanted to be innovative and grow. So what they had come up with was this right on cue in Quincy, and it's, it was simple, yet it had such a powerful impact on their community. And I think they were the one that said for economic development, they had a bunch of people, their businesses just really took off and used it. So these were just some of their examples of strong brands that they've created based on this, this exact same process that, would, that they would be doing for us. So yeah, this, that's what I had. Um, Columbus was another one. This, is, this would be an example of how um, all of our different entities can kind of pull into this new brand and create a uniform look across our city, which we really don't have right now. And consistent colors, consistent fonts, um, all those, what seems simple, but finding a way to make them unique yet fit together. So, any questions? Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Questions? John? Thank you. Uh, Maybe you just alluded to it in what you were talking about, but have you talked to anyone from, like, say, Brookings or any of these other communities? Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, Tara Duncan spends a lot of time with them, our EDA director, and they were very happy with this project. Um, we've, we actually, with that process, we eliminated another, a lot of the other proposals because there was certain communities who had used other companies and weren't as happy with it or aren't actually even using the brands that they had developed for them down the line. Um, Again, I think the Brookings one's probably the best example for us because it has stayed so strong over the last several years that they've used it. Um, and I believe it was Tara that talked to them and said the process was flawless for them. And the other thing, they talk in your uh, presentation, whatever, about doing a tour. Is that they're physically going to come here? Yes, they will make two trips to Marshall. Um, they will come for a familiarization tour and they'll do some of the focus group work while they're here and that's early on I think that's probably week three or four in the project and then they come back you can either have them come for your research presentation or for your final presentation so it would be our choice as to when we would want to have them back in the community And as part of that either visit or research there'd be um, uh, research into marsh and the, yes. how that can be better incorporated into Yes, yeah, they would do a complete brand audit of what we have um, and find ways to be able to tie some of that in and, and hopefully use it better down the line than we have. Other questions? 
Lauren, I just have a question. This is going to be a 24 weeks, but and I apologize because I did not see this at the at the board meeting. Very last page of the presentation, it says travel and miscellaneous are additional. Yep. So other than the two trips, if, they, if we have to have them come three or four times, that would be additional cost. It would, and I actually asked them up front um, because a lot of the proposals we actually asked for a travel cap, and they said that their travel expenses wouldn't be past four thousand dollars. Um, they would keep it within that range and that would be something again if the cbb needed to help um, there's ways around there's ways to reduce those prices they're just giving you an average of plane tickets and hotels and all of that thank you mm -hmm. any other questions for lauren uh, thank you everyone the uh you have the recommendation you have the the request with what is the wishes of the council Make a motion to approve the proposal. I second it. Motion by Jim, seconded by Craig. Discussion? Just a question that the um, dollar amounts coming from the city are coming from reserves, Sharon? That's correct. In both this year and next year? Yes. We can't budget that? Um, we, we, did, we did budget it for 2019 as a budgeted use of reserves. And that would be the recommendation for the next year's budget. Other discussion on the motion? So question, maybe I should ask Lauren, but the group has, with Brookings and Quincy and all these places, with their expenses, did they feel that they saw a return on the investment that was worth it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, those stats are probably, because they're provided by Northstar, they're all optimistic that they'll see a return. But sure. the community, especially Fargo, I think is a big one. They've really seen a lot of visitor growth from it because they're able to tail off of this north of normal feeling of the entire city, so they've, they've seen a lot of visitor growth from them. Okay. Other discussion on the motion? The only, the only concern that I would have is that I think it's a great idea, but if we're going to do something and we're going to market it, it's kind of an all-in type of thing. So if you have somebody downtown that says, oh, I'm for the old way and I don't want to change, that kind of defeats the purpose. So we need to make sure that there's buy-in from chamber and all the chamber men members, and even if they're not chamber members downtown, and I'm not sure how many there are, but it'd be worth talking to them and seeing their their input before we really sink into this all the way, because I think we're either all in or we're not in, and we should be all in, because we need to make Marshall a better place. We did have the chamber as part of the committee as well. Okay, good. Thank you. And on top of that, Steve, I agree. And, and brand identity is a big thing. Huge. And, and Marshall doesn't really have brand identity. I agree. I mean, you can look at our cars. There's three different stickers in our view. That you get brand identity where people see it. Well, you know, North of Norma, I've heard that before, by the way. You know, that's a catchy phrase like that. And people remember that when they come here for hockey tournaments, I don't, whatever we come up with, that sticks in their mind when they look for something to do. Well, that sticks in their mind. So I, I think I agree with you. we got to go all in and, and get the community to support it. And, it can be a very good thing. Yeah. Other discussion on the motion? We'll then move to a vote. Okay, we'll close the voting. The motion does pass. This time I'll call for a five minute recess.
No, he was, I said, let's keep it that way. <laughs> we will reconvene the meeting. The um, um, agenda item number 20, we're on. The, uh, and on agenda item number 20, um, this is to discuss the continuation of the emergency um, declaration. We've uh, asked uh, several people, including our emergency management director, Jim Marshall, to present this, I think. Uh, prior, Jim, you can come forward, and then prior to um, your request, your your presentation, Alex uh, Peterson is going to do a kind of a two-minute uh, video recap of kind of what has gone on over the past several weeks leading up to the emergency declaration. So, with that, I think the video now will come on as part of this presentation. And in fairness to Alex, I think the. Uh, um, the proto or kind of this procedure was um, discussed about two minutes ago. So, yeah. so. <laughs> all good, no worries. It's but he's done the same thing to me. So <laughs> this is true. I have so about faces, fair play. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, no problem, no problem. Um, so as soon as Kyle is able to get the video loaded up here, um, we try to be very proactive in gathering footage, knowing that the likelihood of a flood is coming. So we started the process very early on March 8th, where there was still plenty of snow available. As you can see here, this is going to be a timeline, so it's going to go per location per day. So obviously out here we're at Victory Park. That's what we're showing here. This is March 8th. Plenty of snowpack, uh, more than I'd like to see. Moving forward to March 21st, obviously there's still plenty of ice in the river, but things are starting to open up. This was last Thursday. Um, this was March 23rd, Saturday at 1 p.m. This was roughly 15 minutes after the uh, the, river, the river reached the uh, the weir there and started overflowing. And by 7:30 that night, the flow was coming through quite a bit more. And still, that ice jam right there at Victory Park was obviously still causing issues. Uh, and then we come back the next day. The water had started to recede after it made one heck of a nasty mess of stuff on the edge there um, and again that ice jam was still there it's very obvious that this was the cause of why the river went so high so fast because it just could not flow through here's a view of the underpass uh, under 23 this is the box culverts that would take the overflow water from the redwood river and discharge that into the cottonwood watershed as you can see on march 21st it was not flowing through there it was just a regular snow melt uh, one o'clock. This was the first little bit of water that has ever come over the weir in Victory Park. Uh, we captured it right after it happened. And then coming back at 730, you can see here the water had been up about roughly three feet or so at that point throughout the day and then had dropped back down. I don't have video of when it got really high that night because it happened at about 1:30 in the morning, but uh, it did get a little bit higher than that. 
Uh, this is the area behind the street department shop, uh, just east of Kasuth and uh, east of 7th Street. As you can see, the river here, which is after the confluence, is still very full of ice and snow. Um, at this point, we actually did notice that there was a very large drift going across from the field on the left uh, into the old Skunk Hollow Ranch area, and that did turn out to be an issue when, uh, when the melt started here. March 21st, Thursday, things are starting to open up. Uh, the level's still pretty low, but uh, you can see plenty of ice there. And then things changed pretty rapidly. Um, that big shelf of ice and snow is still there, causing an issue. Now it's starting to route the river instead of around old Skunk Hollow Ranch. It's going right through it at this point. And that did continue on, as you'll see here in just a little bit. This is now March 23rd, Saturday. We have a huge ice jam there, primarily, again, because that big giant snowdrift is still stuck in the way there. Um, so it is flowing significantly more through that area there over into Skunk Hollow Road. And this was Sunday, March 24th. The ice jam had moved through and that big chunk of snowdrift had finally broken loose. Uh, and by the next day, all of this was all cleaned out by Monday morning. Uh, this is Skunk Hollow Road, the, uh, the curve there with the riprap and, and there. So on March 21st, it was already starting to, to get pretty close to the road there. And then of course, uh, on Saturday, it did overtop the road there and fill basically that whole field area. Um, and then eventually did go back into the river just east of uh, Steve, I can't remember his name, his property there. So that's just a quick little recap of how it progressed and how fast it did move forward. We don't have an ending by any chance here, but uh, just a quick little look at that. So we did share that on Facebook. It's had several, several thousand views, of course. I'm guessing most of you have seen it, but uh, just wanted to go ahead and give that for a formal presentation. Uh, any questions for me before I turn it over to Jim? We'll probably hold up with questions, but thank you, Alex. Sure. We'll probably hold up until after Absolutely. Jim's uh, uh, presentation. But again, um, we'll do this later, but Alex has done great work with the uh, videography with the drone. Yes, Mayor and Council, good evening. Um, I think I'm going to just begin by sharing a few, uh, taking a few minutes to update you on some of the things that we've done this past month, or a few steps that we've taken regarding uh, emergency management within the city. On March 8th, we organized what I'm gonna call our first flood informational meeting um, that included personnel that we would believe would be part of our emergency operation plan or our emergency operations center. The goal of that meeting was really twofold. Number one was to help us uh, first uh, help us identify our, our roles and responsibilities when it comes to our emergency operations plan. And then the second thing was to begin the discussion on the potential flooding concerns that could impact our city. We held five informational, flood informational meetings, the first one being at City Hall, and then the last four at uh, the Merit Center, which is currently our emergency operations center. And really the um, reason for those meetings, again, is to um, discuss concerns regarding our, our potential flooding within the city. Um, our meetings have included participation from the National Weather Service to give us current detailed weather forecasts, as well as participation from our <coughs> local hydrologist to provide us with uh, some of their local predictions. Each meeting has included briefings from our different divisions within the city, from our wastewater to um, uh, street department to our engineering department to finance as well as we all, and we have also included Marshall Utilities in on those meetings as well. Um, and again, during our meetings, we would also identify goals or tasks that needed to be completed to ensure the integrity of our infrastructure into our citizens' property. On March 13th, which was a Wednesday night, uh, the county emergency manager held a countywide meeting and encouraged all the cities within Lyon County to declare a state of emergency so that potential costs associated with um, flood relief efforts could be considered for reimbursements. At that time, we were confident that uh, we would not exceed our local capabilities and uh, we simply would continue with our efforts to address our localized flooding. Moving to this past weekend on Saturday on, on March 23rd in the morning, um, we had the historic event of water finding its way over the fixed weir at Victory Park or what we most know as Wayside Rest. Um, this flow, which we knew was really caused because of the ice jams that Alex had showed on that video, um, caused some nervousness. It also gave us some reassurance that the flood project worked. I guess it did what it was designed to do. Um, the overflow on that Saturday morning, and I don't know if anybody had a chance to be out there, was, I would say, it was mild, 
gentle probably in nature and eventually in the afternoon it had had stopped um, but on Saturday night or Sunday morning uh, the flow at the weir had increased in size and volume of water that was going through it so on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock we again convened our, our information meeting at uh, the Merit Center um, to discuss the concerns and efforts that could be done to in, to in case the significant flow continued um, to be clear, we were not in crisis mode at that time, but I think we, everybody in attendance ha had agreed that in case outside resources were needed, that we would request, and we had asked the mayor at that time to consider declaring a state uh, of emergency for the city of Marshall, which he eventually did, and you guys were notified r right after uh, that was done. Um, the declaration of emergency expedites a necessary response in recovery to our community when it's in a time of crisis and it authorizes aid and assistance without complying with the time consuming restraint, the, the constraints that goes with, uh, with making those requests. Um, so here's the deal, here we are. And I realize that um, since Sunday, Sunday's emergency declaration, we have seen improvement as far as the levels of water that's going through the river and the really no incidents with the, the ice jam since then. But I think it's important for me to continue to remind everybody that we are currently still under a flood warning for our area. And uh, we know that the next few days are gonna bring some significant um, melting that will also can contribute to the river and what we're gonna see coming downstream towards us. So because of this, I guess tonight, it's my recommendation to you, the council, to extend the emergency declaration that uh, the mayor did on Sunday. And uh, just to ensure that we have the resources are, the access to the resources that we need if, if so needed. Um, I don't know if there's any specific questions um, that you have regarding anything with flood mitigation. Glenn, his engineers of the street department and wastewater, all I can say is just, they've done such an outstanding job and we're so fortunate to have uh, their skills and knowledge and they just know water. They know how it works, they know where things go. So that's really taken a lot of um, stress off my plate just knowing how the knowledge they bring to the table so Let me just question make a couple of comments and thank you Jim I think Jim has uh, you know stepped into this role as <laughs> our new director of public safety and he's done a really nice job in leading our uh, emergency management in his role as emergency management director and that's probably a role that um, is not the, the primary consideration when he considers his uh, duties as director of public safety but certainly is very important other staff that are here is along with Sharon and Glenn, Olson, our city engineer, Jason Anderson, our assistant city engineer, our finance uh, department uh, uh, led by Annette and Kyle, who is really documenting everything through the whole process, as well as others that aren't present, wastewater and uh, some of our other engineering folks and uh, street department folks that have all been participants, have really all kind of followed the protocol that has been outlined in our um, emergency operation plan that this council adopted a number of years ago and it has been implemented uh, very well. Now the emergency declaration, um, I have the authority to enact that and that authority is valid for 72 hours. So that's the reason for the Jim's request for the extension is to um, extend that for 30 days given the uncertainty of what may happen over the course of the next month. We'll open up for any input or questions. Jim, what are the implications of a de declared state of emergency? I mean, is there any cost to the city? Is there any anything other than expediting N nothing, help if we need nothing. it? Nothing. And I think it just keeps us on the state's radar as uh, maybe yeah. the potential I think it's an Absolutely. awesome idea because we, right, like you said, there's an awful lot of snow out there still. We're going to start getting warm. And then if we get a couple of really good rains, we're in trouble. <laughs> the other point, and certainly this is not the reason to do it, but it, it would be one of the uh, uh, perhaps effects of being in an emergency is that if there is a broader declaration statewide or even regional wise, um, you would be eligible for reimbursement. Some of the costs that have been and will be incurred, such as an example of that would be hiring a backhoe to get, you know, to break up an ice jam or to get logs out of the river or do things that you normally would not have to do other than this 
this emergency so in this situation and I know our staff are coding their expenses that are directly related to the flood response so that if in the future that there is the need to provide that documentation for potential reimbursement that, that is being done I know Annette is leading that long way of response sorry that's okay yeah, and then and the other piece of that is obviously to reach out for state and federal assets if, God forbid, we'd have that need. The, we have to have the emergency deck, and then we have to exceed our, our capabilities. So it just frees everybody up to make those instantaneous decisions without having to bring the council together for an emergency meeting and doing an emergency proclamation at that time. It tells us also, it tells our staff that we trust them to continue to operate in that diligent mode and that we trust them to make good and equitable decisions on the city's behalf in the in those moments of, of crisis and they've, they've showed us that we can trust them you know, one thing um thank you craig the um when i was calling out individual people i i did not call out alex peterson uh, uh, <laughs> yes. you, who? And, <laughs> <laughs> you you and jim you may want to make some comments yeah. about the training both Alex and Jasmine have gone through, but uh, Alex has done a very nice job with her, uh, not only being a professional participant and helping to document things on video, but then also managing our social media. And we've had really uh, incredible participation of viewership on that. But you may we, want to make some. We have Alex and, Jas and Jasmine um, have currently been going through the certification process for emergency management, as well as Jason Kapitsky with the police department. Jason has a little bit more to do with his. Alex and Jasmine have just completed, on Tuesday, on Tuesday just completed their certification. So it's an accomplishment in itself. It's a, a real time commitment. But I can tell already, just like the skills that Alex brings to the table, it's, uh, it's gonna be great to have him and just have the stuff that he can do with the video footage and how that helps us and really helps engineering uh, kind of figure things out as well has been a true benefit to us and just what it's done for our emergency operations center um, we had a meeting out there today and and again it's something that we really can be proud of I, I would uh, put ours up against anybody else's in the state and we're still process in the process of making improvements to it but it's just a great facility and I'm glad we did that pr approximately two years ago and just a comment it makes sense to do this for another 30 days because we are certainly not out of the snow season or you know when it was rain the, the for forbid we don't know what's coming yeah. yeah the forecast for Friday Saturday is another big moisture event going right up according to the models the path of the of that vortex that went so it's going to go south of us but it's a big moisture event again I'll make a motion to approve the emergency declaration for another second case. motion by Jim seconded by Steve discussion if not, we'll move to a vote. Thank you, Jim, Alex, Jasmine, everybody, Glenn, Mayor. So the uh, we'll close the voting, <coughs> and that motion does pass. What? Bob. Bob. <laughs> you better reopen. <laughs> Okay, so I mean, I was gonna vote yes anyway. So of course. okay, sorry about that. Um, we'll then move then to uh, the next agenda item. This is uh, agenda item uh, number 21, consider the renewal of the agreement with uh, Pyrotechnic Display Inc. Uh, for the City of Marshall for the July 4th uh, fireworks. With us is Community Services Director Scott Vanderbilt. And Scott, welcome. Thank you, Mayor and Council. As indicated in your background information, um, our current contract expires after uh, this July 4th. Um, this is a company that the city has worked with uh, for the past six years and um, would like to continue doing business with. Um, I thought uh, Dale Nowak did a good job in his uh, information and contract that he extended uh, explaining um, the rationale for the cost increase. Um, but this is the first significant cost increase um, in the six years um, that we've worked with pyrotechnic display so i'm open to answering any questions if needed questions for scott 
I guess the question I have, and you see a lot of other communities um, solicit donations for fireworks. Is that something that's a possibility? Because I see we're shortening the program by, you know, it says three, I believe three minutes or so. But if we solicit donations, is, is that something community services ever looked at? And I know other communities in northern Minnesota, it's a big deal to donate to the fireworks display. I mean, yeah. We we do solicit donations, Jim, and we actually have um, three what I would refer to as corporate partners, hy V being one of them. Uh, the Kiwanis uh, assists us with that. So um, we do offset that $11,000 cost each year, depending on what those organizations can commit on a yearly basis. So, and Jim, just a correction, the two to, uh, would be two to three minutes shorter if Correct. they wanted to maintain their present loan. Correct. So $10,000 number, going to $11,800. 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Doesn't decrease the time, but if we want to, then it goes down. The way I read it, and that correct? is correct. Yep. So if we wanted to stay with approximately 17 minutes, we could stay with the present number of ten thousand dollars. That's correct. Yeah. I want 25 minutes. Get more donations. <laughs> Just write out a check. <laughs> <laughs> Lazinski Construction can donate. I make a motion to approve it. Yeah. Yeah. Second Seconds. by Jim. Seconded by Steve. Discussion. Yeah, can we add into that that we accept the donation from Lazinski? <laughs> <laughs> no, we probably want to call the question, Jim. So the, uh, we'll move to a vote. Post the voting. That motion passes. Moving to the next agenda item, this would be agenda item number 22, consider the approval of the labor agreements uh, between the City of Marshall and the law LELS, Law Enforcement Labor Services, the local number 190. With us tonight is Sheila Dubbs, and before we start, Sheila, thank you for, as well as sharing your efforts, as well as the um, um, law enforcement in working to this, um, this recommendation, I realize it has taken a substantial amount of uh, discussion and time so thank you for that with that Sheila thank you mayor and council the existing labor agreement with our LELS uh, 190 bargaining unit which is the patrol officers did expire on December 31st of 2018 uh, we have reached a tentative agreement with the union on contract terms for a new three-year agreement I'll briefly summarize the contract amendments proposed this evening and then answer any questions that you might have uh, we have a tentative agreement on three-year contract duration that would begin January 1st of 2019 and expire on December 31st, 2021. In Article 5, uh, the language reflects minor technical changes to the union security clause relating to the payment of dues by union members. Um, and this language was proposed by our labor attorney. In Article 12, in the wages clause, this language reflects an increase in shift differential from 30 cents to 50 cents per hour and an increase in field officer training pay from $1 to $1.25 for the actual hours worked in that role. Um, the date of January 1st, 2014, um, you may have questioned that is actually not an error in those two clauses. It was recommended by our labor attorney to retain the existing clause in the agreement because neither of the specialty pay types that uh, will be retroactive to January 1st. So if approved by the council this evening, the new rates for these two specialty pays will be effective on Monday, April 1st. Um, Article 13 of the overtime clause, um, the maximum accrual limit for compensatory time will increase from 45 to 50 hours. For the insurance clause in Article 16, the, um, this is amended to reflect the three-year duration of the agreement. Uh, in Article 20, the language immediately below the schedule of accruals has been deleted, and this was a clause that restricted new employees from using their vacation accruals in the first six months of employment. None of our other groups uh, have that restriction, so that has been deleted from the contract, proposed to be deleted. Uh, in Article 23, this relates to the holidays. The proposed language relates to those situations where an employee is not scheduled to work on the recognized holiday. So where the employee is not scheduled to work, the amendment in the contract allows for the employee a choice of either eight hours of time off on a different day or eight hours of holiday pay. 
If the employee elects the eight hours of time off on a different day, the contract language has been added, which pays out unused holiday hours on the first paycheck of December. In Article 25 for leave of absences, uh, this language has been added uh, to reference three laws that may be applicable to employees requesting a leave of absence, and that is the Family Medical Leave Act, the Parental Leave Act, and the Women's Economic Security Act. Um, consideration for the approval or denial of employee leaves will continue to be administered in accordance with both state and federal laws. The ad addition of that language does not actually add additional leave benefits to this group of employees. Um, they will still receive the same leave benefit options and protections as all other employees. Uh, the union just requested this language so that employees of the union were more aware of the va available options to them. In Appendix A, uh, the wage schedules, the tentative agreement reflects a change in the schedule of 2% general wage increase for 2019 plus a 40 cent market adjustment added to each step, a 3.25 general wage increase for 2020 and a 3.25 general increase for 2021. The, uh, there are two attachments, the memorandum of, of understanding. The first one identifies the effective dates of the proposed wage schedules. Um, this has been consistent with prior approvals of the council um, in prior years as well as for the most recent AFSCME group as well. Um, and lastly, there is a memorandum of agreement related to the accrual of compensatory time. Um, this particular memorandum of agreement will expire on December 31st, 2021. The language is consistent uh, with the current administration of earned compensatory time accruals. Uh, and placing the language in this memorandum of agreement instead of in the contract allows our new director to evaluate the administration of compensatory time over the life of the agreement. If the director would propose a change in the administration during the next contract cycle, the city would be in a better position to do that versus being required to negotiate it as terms within a contract. I have included in your background materials the estimate, estimated fiscal impacts of the specialty pay as well as the wage proposal. Um, staff are recommending adoption of the resolution approving the three agreements. Thank you, Sheila. Sharon, do you have anything you want to add? I uh, if you recall, the council did have a closed session discussing the, the labor agreements, uh, not only asked me, but LELS, and we did make some points uh, regarding why this is important to approve the contract. And I just want to um, highlight a few of those points. Uh, one is with approval of this contract, we avoid arbitration. And uh, one of the likely is not computed on the cost impacts is we are averting the cost the legal cost of arbitration and the potential of losing an arbitration the city has been in arbitration uh, with this particular group three times since 2006 one of our um, difficulties potentially if we do not approve the contract and end up in arbitration is that the uh, LELS wage scale in comparison to comparison cities, we are out of market. Uh, it is greater than 5% on the max and greater than 10% on the starting wage. So uh, what this contract does is it gets us a little bit closer. One of the discussion items that the council uh, had was the number of steps and the increase between the steps and our desire uh, from the HR perspective and something we'll be presenting to council is that uh, we will want to do a compensation study and uh, citywide in that in that particular process we will again look at market number of steps and hopefully bring um, the market wages for LELS officer unit uh, much closer than we are today and so we we hope going forward there won't have to be uh, as much work on the on the wage wages as it were in this contract but I think it's highly important that we approve this contract um, just based on past history and potentially where we would be if we, if we had further legal legal implications with the contract 
Thank you, Sheriff. Sure. Open it up for questions. I, I don't have a question. I think that Sheila and Sharon did a great job. I think they put a lot of work into this, a lot of research, and I thank them very much for that. I think this is a, a good deal. Other input? <laughs> no. Go ahead. Okay, Judge. Make a motion to approve the uh, uh, the agreement. So I would second that. Motion by John, seconded by Steve, to approve the labor agreement between the City of Marshall and LALS Local 190. Now, a discussion on that motion. Well, I, I came prepared to vote against this tonight, and uh, I, I have been concerned about the salary schedule and the number of steps and. Uh, what I would prefer is smaller steps, but more of them. I think that's the trend in other cities, and I'd like to see the city move in that direction. And uh, if, if that is the plan of the city, is to move in that direction, then I can support this, because I, I think that's a needed change, and it will improve our salaries schedule, and uh, it's unusual for me, but I, I'll support it. The only I don't want to stop this momentum. The only comment I'll make on the number of steps, in particular for uh, our law enforcement employees, is that the longevity is a lot different than other government employees. They tend to have a, a, a shorter uh, tenure just based on the nature of their work, night shift, day shift, things like that. But we definitely want to have a, a longer step payment plan, and we want to have one pay plan for for the entire city as we currently do we don't want to stray from that so appreciate your comments um, with regard to that and I'm not saying that the uh, the steps for the number of steps for police officers would be the same as every other employee I, I don't think it would have to be that way but um, I, w I would like the city overall to look at that seriously mm -hmm. and uh, take action before our next agreement so thank you okay uh, any other discussion on the motion? If not, we'll move to a vote. Close to voting. The motion does pass unanimously. We'll move then to the next agenda item, which is agenda item number 23. This is a request for a rezoning a map amendment. Uh, Ilya Gutman. Thank you, Mayor Council. Um, can I have the... Uh, just to orient uh, uh, everyone, uh, this is a corner of West Main and Channel Parkway. Uh, Marshall Machine Shop is in the yep. hard left. Oops. Oops. Something? <laughs> Dog on it. <laughs> there we go. Right there. We got it. Here, Doc's got it oh, for I you. I got it for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's your, he's your right hand back. I'm a techno geek. <laughs> okay. This is Marshall Machine Shop. He's a council member in charge of the pointer. Okay. Exactly. I think I got it. <laughs> right there. Absolutely. So this is Marshall Machine Shop and a uh, uh, corner of uh, West Main and Channel Parkway. And we are talking about these three lots. Uh, if you can go now to the uh, zoning map. The owner of the Marshall Machine Shop wants to add to the building. And uh, uh, the use of the building, existing building, is manufacturing, and of course the addition will be also used manufacturing. The problem is that uh, the addition will go over the property line and will uh, protrude into these uh, 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 lots that we are talking about. The, the, those lots currently are uh, zoned uh, general business, which manufacturing is not allowed in, which means that they must be uh, rezoned to uh, <coughs> general uh, b uh, industrial district the way it is the building is right now so as you can see that uh, all around it's industrial 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 so rezoning these three district uh, three uh, parcels to industrial will be consistent with the surrounding area so that's why the recommendation is to uh, rezone to allow for addition Excellent. questions for Ilya 
I move approval. Second. Okay. Motion by uh, Steve, second, or motion by Craig, seconded by Russ um, to approve the recommendation. Discussion? If not, we'll move to a vote. Close the voting. The motion does pass. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Elliot. Thank Move then to agenda item number 25, uh, the authorization for the Parks Department to apply for a Minnesota DNR Outdoor Recreation Grant. Um, Preston Stentrude is here this evening to um, request um, this authorization to apply for this grant. Preston. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, this grant uh, opportunity through the Department of Natural Resources and state of Minnesota came available sometime in January I believe um, Amanda Beckler and myself have put in uh, several um, hours working on it it's like a 19 page application um, we got some final numbers to put in uh, for the end of the week before the end of the week is due on Friday um, <clears throat> basically what we're hoping to apply for is out at the new ball field site uh, our master plan was to have a shelter house out there which isn't currently out there or was it in our uh, you know drawings by the architects or whatever we knew was going to be a future um, project um, and based on what the application asked for for projects they're looking for we feel this fits very strongly it talks about connecting to um, bike trails and recreation areas and promoting um, outdoor living and uh, activities um, so with that we kind of went through everything um, we came up with a you know it's a 24 by 24 picnic shelter we call it a picnic <coughs> pavilion strictly for the fact that I think it sounds a little more catchy than a shelter um, there's a storage facility on the back of it because uh, we're lacking storage out there uh, we don't have any room for um, like chalk the ball pro rakes any stuff like that it's all held over at the arena that we bring it over every day so this would keep it right on site um i did kind of this is the whole property layout which we have to submit with it um the yellow area um, north would be to the right of the screen i guess um, the playground is going in um, right on the top there in the green um, and this is real close to scale if not right on um, unless our sizes would change um, but with with the grant it would cover all the yellow the sidewalk going in the construction of uh, shelter house and storage area uh, picnic tables for it receptacles and then just kind of any I mean there's other materials so with that um, today we haven't got the final numbers from a contractor that's working on an estimate we also have to submit a detailed drawing elevation side view and top view of the facility um, hope to have that tomorrow he called me this afternoon to submit um, I'm estimating it that 103 750 is it or 500 103,500 for the complete project um, if we were awarded the grant that would be a 50% match by the DNR um, and we have till the 2021 to complete it but I figured we'd budget our share into the 2020 budget and then we do construction next year so I've got some time to allow all this and we go to bid and do all that stuff so I'm um, just strictly asking for authorization to um, proceed and there's a resolution in there that um, says that you guys authorize that that has to be signed and included with the application process <coughs> thank you Preston yep. questions so, so the overall uh, resolution here is to authorize you to apply for it yeah just saying that you're okay with us moving forward um, and submitting the application that you're aware of it so. and then once we had more details and the council would approve actual yep, we construction, would uh, we'd bring the grant um, document back for approval as well uh, when I think of the, the DNR I don't think of improvements at a ballpark is is this normal for them to do that type of thing yeah um, I don't know how normal it is but uh, for an actual facility but based on what their wording was for the requirements it kind of fits right in with recreational areas 
um, and it could be repurposing old buildings, building new buildings. The only thing it excluded 100% was it couldn't be used to build a ice arena. Other than that, it was pretty well open for whatever your sales pitch was, I guess. Present so. isn't isn't present isn't part of the the attractiveness of this possibly for that is the fact that it's connected to the bike trail. Yep. Also. yep. Mm -hmm. And we put in there, you know, the Camden regional trails just across but I have an aerial that shows right where it's at right. so we'll be able to kind of list that out and show you know it's a block down but there's there's concrete that's connecting it so so it's a rest area I'm just yeah. joking yeah. <laughs> it could be that too yeah <laughs> <laughs> nicely played <laughs> are there any other questions for Preston so the only question Preston is if we don't get the grant then then we just have then to we put it on hold and figure yep, out if we want to foot yeah. the whole thing or we don't want to do it at all or or if there's a different funding source yep. right. right i move that we allow preston to go forward with the grant second motion by steve seconded by jim discussion if not we'll move to a vote close the voting motion passes Moving forward, then the uh, agenda item number tw 26 and 27 are both uh, calling for a public hearing on the proposed property tax abatement uh, locations 305 and 307 Brussels Court. The, uh, can this be handled um, in one motion? And the uh, that way, if uh, any individuals wish to abstain, that allows them to do this. So any questions about the request to call for public hearing? I, I move the Second. proposal. Motion by Jim, second. No. Ed, or excuse me, motion <laughs> by... I don't know why I get you See, guys that really up. hurt. <laughs> <laughs> motion by Craig, seconded by John. To uh, call for... To call for the public hearing on the proposed property tax abatement for properties at 305 and 307 Brussels Court. Discussion? If not, we'll move to a vote. If I got kicked out again, Kyle says, oops, something went wrong. What? <laughs> it does? It's an operator. Yes, it's it's operator. clearly an operator. It's a broken window. I don't know. Operator. It's fractured. It is. It says, oops. We can do voice, <laughs> voice vote if you want, Kyle. No, I'm happy. Did you pay attention to him, Jim, so you can see how to fix it? <laughs> no, I'm not that quick. He's just like at the airport. Cool. Yeah. I'm working on it. Okay. No. Might need a refresher course. No, it's just. You want to abstain? I do. Which I'm glad it's not you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Works well. Are we ready? Okay, let's move on. <laughs> so we'll close the voting. Wow, uh, that's a mess. Oh, I think you better. Russ, did you forget <laughs> the vote? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so I'm so I'm He's wearing it all on your ass. Bob, you didn't vote either. Yeah. We better reopen. Re that's a mess. We'll, we'll do a voice vote on this so we can move on. So all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstention? Aye. Kyle, you have the vote. The vote passes. We'll note the abstention. <laughs> it wasn't just me there, guys. Of course, I'm busy helping you. I got distracted. Yeah. Okay. So then we'll move then to uh, Commission Board Liaison Reports. Actually, I'll keep mine very brief given the hour. Um, the um, um, Southwest Regional Development Commission um, had rescheduled their meeting twice because of the, the weather and then the rescheduled time was Friday afternoon, and that was also the time that our uh, emergency operations team meeting, so I did not attend that meeting. So um, it was a very brief meeting from what I understand. So with that, Greg. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Merritt's uh, Center Board met last Thursday. I was there for part of the time. Um, I actually delivered the report uh, on the activities there earlier, but um, there's a lot of good training, both law enforcement, fire, industry, there's a lot of energy coming with uh, Minnesota West and some curriculum shopping that they're doing. The marketing group has is, is been working on um, additional training events out there. So, um, and of course, there's a lot of excitement about getting started with the finish the build out of the rest of the driving track and the skid pad and 
skills pad. So um, I guess I'll leave it at, at that for now. Jim, is there anything else that you can think of that I'm missing or that the that the council should hear about tonight? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Craig, Steve. Um, Community Services Advisory Board did not meet and I was unable to go to the EDA because of work commitments. What? I was un wasn't able to attend the uh, Housing Commission meeting because I had a conflict mm -hmm. and I believe Planning Commission's meeting this week, later this week. Uh, unfortunately, I was also not able to go to the EDA meetings uh, or the MMU meeting, but uh, there was a fair amount at the MMU meeting. Uh, uh, as far as a resolution, a local commitment to project funding for the soft softening enhancement project for the water treatment uh, brought up. Uh, they're uh, aiming to go for uh, a June 11th uh, bid letting right now with uh, what's going on. And uh, I guess if uh, I think most of us probably remember uh, uh, Danny Yost as far as a reporter that was uh, in Marshall, she did a story for uh, uh, really the same subject in Morris, uh, Minnesota, kind of what's going on there. So if anybody's interested, I've got a copy of that article, uh, or you can pull it up online. But uh, uh, really covers, hits right in with what we're looking at doing. So we're in the middle of it right now. I think that's about it. Ray, Ray. 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 I'm sorry, Ray. Ray. Yeah. And Russ. Uh, Police Advisory Board met. Uh, I was able to participate in oral interviews with the seven, or seven applicants. Uh, they did establish an eligibility roster and also looking at uh, the process for promotional for kids. Corporals. Uh, CVB met and we, we entertained part of that tonight with the branding update. Uh, we have a couple of board openings. They also took receipt of the preliminary audit review. Uh, we did not have a chance to examine it in full detail, but uh, the auditors have given the CVB board specific uh, changes to be made in their accountability, how things are going to process from the future regarding the past situation. So. Uh, positive note, uh, the event update, they only have one open date, which is May 12th, I believe. Otherwise, every weekend has been booked at the arena. And that's about all I have. Thank you, Russ. Jim, when did I mean? We'll move then to uh, Council Member individual items. Uh, Jim, let's start with on your end. Um, last Wednesday, Sharon and I went to a training in Tracy on uh, City Council meetings. On meetings. Uh, we went over open law meetings, which we comply very well. Um, we also touch base on closed meetings and what can be used as a recorder. We can move beyond the tape recorder. We can go digital. Uh, I, I think we're about the only council there that actually uses cassette tapes. So um, they did make the point that they have to be clear. So I think, you know, we have Alex back there who's very good with technology. I think we should set something up digital and, and move into the new century. Um, and they also talked about um, <laughs> meeting conduct and I just after seeing some of the videos they showed we have a very good council they showed videos of some councils that they don't interact very well <laughs> so um, I was like that's a compliment to all of us on the council that even though we disagree we have a very good council discussion and, and that was a good um, input there and it was a good training it was close it was local and I learned a lot um, the one point I did learn I should share with you guys Open meeting law violations, we as the council members pay the fine. The city does not. Right. Right. So just a reminder that if it comes up, fortunately we are a council of seven. It runs as more of an issue, and they use the example of a council of five where three people met, and they met several times in a small city on road construction. They ended up with about a $3,300 fine, wasn't it? So, you know, it's and the city does not pay that fine. So just keep that in mind. So. And besides that, I have nothing. Thank you, Jim. Russ? Councilman uh, Meister and myself kicked off the town hall meetings, and the first question out of the audience was they wanted to know if the mayor was going to be present. So I just thought we'd let you know that. <laughs> so for future, future meetings. Well, Otherwise, they, if I could comment on that, I intentionally don't go to that because that is the town hall meetings for the council members. And we that, did bring that up, that you yep. had the, the state of the city at the university and your, and your event with Sharon at the senior center. So. Yeah, I, I think it was just a question that came from the audience. Uh, you know, typical things at the town hall meeting, the shop closing that was just announced, I believe, that day or that day. 
maybe Steve and True Shrimp. City Hall update, there were some questions about City, excuse me, City Hotel update. You know, there were some questions about getting rid of that eyesore, and we just told them as much as we knew at this point, and everybody was kind of in agreement that we're proceeding on a uh, with the removal of the asbestos and things like that. Housing and apartments, and uh, we had a, v a couple of comments about uh, the snow and water flow issues, but Steve, I don't know if you can add anything else. It was a good, good first meeting. I wish it would have been better attended. Absolutely, but we've talked about that with the advertising and stuff. And lesson learned. Yeah. Yep. I just uh, cover a little bit on the. Uh, well, actually, we started out a discussion on the snow, but uh, we're gonna. I want to kind of elevate it up a little bit. I had a little talk with uh, Sharon and uh, uh, before the meeting here. Uh, as far as you know, we're heading into a season now where. Uh, before we were asking if somebody wanted to report problems with sidewalks not getting shoveled, ice build up, or whatever, uh, how to handle a complaint going into the city. Uh, and uh, probably to make that a little bit easier, and some people don't like the idea of complaining about it. It's not really a complaint, it's reporting it or whatever. But uh, we talked about setting up a uh, <clears throat> website uh, on our website uh, a portion where somebody can go in and enter in and uh, submit a report on that uh, there is a reason for calling it a complaint is because in the state statutes if somebody complains and it doesn't say reports but is if it complains uh, then that person remains anonymous uh, so there is a reason for calling it maybe maybe both both uh, a reporting means and a complaint means. But we've got things coming up with uh, potholes coming up that probably want to get uh, identified, uh, weed control. Uh, hopefully we're going to get back to grass growing here and things like that, So, um, as well as snow removal and all that. But it, and it doesn't have to be constantly a complaint of something either. It could be just a positive saying, hey, we think you did a great job of cleaning off the snow or whatever. But setting that up on a website that somebody can go in and uh, enter that and it'll send out an email or whatever. Now, as we proved a little bit earlier, not everybody is that fluent on computers. <laughs> <laughs> so to make it a little bit easier as well, uh, probably uh, could start with the, the regular city phone number to call in and just uh, do a, a you know, person to person vo uh, voicing of what's going on or a potential of setting up a, a number that just goes right to a recording and say, hey, I'd just like to report that address such and such uh, maybe the weeds are growing or something like that, that we can get that in and get it documented. But make it easy to do. Um, it's not, you know, somebody feels like, you know, gee, I have to get a hold of whether it's engineering or somebody to get on how do I do it, but make it a little bit more obvious, uh, bring it out a little bit more, and uh, uh, make it a little bit more user-friendly. So I think that's about it. Thank you, John. And Sharon, I know you've discussed that with staff, too. So, Greg? Um, I really don't have much. I just, Jim and I did our town hall uh, a couple days after last Thursday, and I think we were a little less attended, but it was still a good discussion and, um, and the same issues. You know, there were some questions about economic development, and we explained where that goes. And um, other than that, it was, you know, I think one of the things we talked about too, and, and we've talked to Sharon about this and, and others that, you know, I think it's important for us to maintain that contact with our constituents. I think there might be some other avenues too that may be more beneficial or as beneficial and might, might be more acceptable. So I think just keep keeping us reaching out and making us accessible and, and making people comfortable. I know obviously people don't like to come to council meetings. I think they're intimidated by coming in front of the council we sit here on our in our arc and and I think that just making it more personal is probably more comfortable for a lot of people so I think we need to continue to look at that ability to interact and be available and I just appreciate the people that did attend and I think it was a, it was they were good I, I actually crashed uh, the first one by by Russ and, and Steve and, and I appreciate their hospitality to let me sit in the room and, and engage with the group. It was really, it was really, they were both nice meetings. 
That's all I have. We have a great council. I just want to say that. And it's fun to work with it. We, like Jim said, we may not all agree sometimes, but we all have fun and can give each other a good time. Um, on the city council town hall meetings, I think they were good. Uh, maybe an idea that could make it even better improvement, again, going with technology. If Alex can videotape them and do those going forward, you know, and have a live call in thing. That might be a, something to think about. I don't know how hard that would be or how much it would cost, but thinking outside the box. Yeah. I'm a man of few words, so I'll pass. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't even want I to want the real Glenn Bear Cole to return, because this is not him. <laughs> I, Glenn, I, you, I like you, the you Glenn. You didn't even promote hours coming up on, uh, yeah. what is it, first time? April Glenn, can we call this the new Glenn to blend? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Glenn. The, uh, I'll hit on just four quick points. The, um, um, you know, we had an extensive discussion about flooding, and I'll just say one more thing on that. The, uh, in terms of communication, the, um, you know, we relied on uh, social media. Alex was uh, very helpful on that, and amazingly, there is like nine thousand views on mm -hmm. everyone. Four or five of them, so so that's a it's a surprising way to get information to the public. Fast, we don't know where that public is at. They could be there was one person had a comment who lives in Chicago, but the uh, you know certainly it is a, a way of getting information out that has been effective, and it's really because of the technology and the expertise that we have available, through Alex, as well as the technology that he has and knows how to use. So. Um, and we also talked about the Emergency Operations Center and how the Merit Center has really been an improved location for that. Um, not only the location, but the space that is available, the technology that's available, the um, connectivity that's available. And I think when time allows, maybe prior to a council meeting in the future, it might be good to have a, um, a tour there and have folks like Jim and Alex and Jasmine kind of go through what the capabilities are there and how that fits into the emergency operations plan. And then one final thing on flooding. Um, this morning, thank you, Glenn Olson. Uh, Glenn and I were um, uh, spent a, from about 5 a.m. to 7.30 a.m. with KSFY uh, at various locations. They were doing live reports in their morning news. So thank you, Glenn, for getting up at four o'clock in the morning and still um, being alert at this hour, so thank you. <laughs> and then uh, one final thing, uh, several weeks ago, Sharon and I um, met with the Marshall Area Hockey Association leadership to really discuss what some of their future plans are and how that could interface with some of the needs that are, that are at the Red Baron Arena and then how to, um, maybe fit this into a long-term master plan and specifically the need that the city has identified as need for additional parking, most likely on that north side. Um, the need that Maha has identified that they would like to pursue at that location but with their own resources is uh, outdoor ice and then at a future planning, a, um, a <clears throat> addition on the facility that would accommodate some of their dry land and um, and fitness area. Now, n you know, none of those things are in the immediate plan, but I think our discussion was the um, that really needs to be on <coughs> on the footprint. So, so there is some kind of planning of what should be where long term, where should the additional parking be where if there is an outdoor ice, how should that be configured so it doesn't interfere with anything future? So I think that was really the nature of really a good discussion is uh, let's look at the entire footprint and um, you know kind of come to some agreement that can be proposed about long term. What is the long term plan you know for the space utilization on that site? With that, uh, that's all that I have. So let's move forward then to agenda item number 30 staff report starting with city administrator Sharon mr. mayor and council just a brief uh, 
topic, I do want to reiterate what Councilman Lozinski stated about the Tracy Council training. It was really good, and I thought I knew everything about open meeting law, but I actually learned a few things, and uh, it was an enjoyable trip down to Tracy with our city vehicle and uh, had a good conversation uh, as well. So it was nice to support Tracy, but also to learn something from that training. So that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, just a couple of items. I'd like to get together with Jim to um, have a post-flood review. That's really important after an event like this. The uh, Corps of Engineers will be visiting to go through the operation of what happened with the overflow uh, soon. And also USGS would like to come and take a look at what the flow distribution might have been uh, during the event. They're going to quantify uh, what that, um, that flow was. It's going to be very difficult. We've talked to them already uh, concerning uh, ice uh, blockage, uh, not being able to quantify the flow as much as they'd like to have. Uh, they did want a uh, phone call as soon as the river opened up, and which I did that today. Uh, told them about when it opened. So uh, post-flood review is probably our next item for discussion. Uh, if you looked at the flood gauge, it was significantly lowered today, uh, below 16 feet for a high. So that really makes a difference to what our preparations for the next event would be. That's all I have. And Dennis. Oh. Follow on. Councilmember Bayer Colbert's <laughs> less is more. Yeah. <laughs> we, we do have some major cleanups that are going to take place, specifically at uh, Victory Park. Lots of debris. Lots of debris in the river. Um, we have to identify what that is for a uh, cost of cleanup. We'll move then to agenda item number 33, which is the information items. Uh, and that includes agenda item number 34, the street closure for right out food service. And that is there for information purposes, not action, correct? Correct. That's correct. Now, there was discussion a year ago about um, why wouldn't they want to move to the Merritt Center. I think that should be uh, re-discussed, but we I maybe agree. aren't ready for them yet this year. That then I'll move to agenda item number 35, our listing of our upcoming meetings, and agenda item number 36 to consider adjourning. This Moved. Meeting. Second. Yeah, I, by, I, I'm going to retract my motion and I'm going to defer to my esteemed colleague. <laughs> <laughs> Man, <laughs> <of> human rights. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, make, I'll make the motion then. Motion by Glad now, seconded so by second. Kim. <laughs> To uh, adjourn discussion. If not, we'll move to a vote. I'm going to vote yes for that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we'll, vote, we'll close the we voting. Need to go to a voice vote on this. Everyone voted. We're adjourned. <laughs> 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 <laughs>